Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the together. Huh? There we go. Are we ready now? Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to call to order the October 9th, 2023 regular meeting of the Melville City Council. On account of the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom. In-person participants, if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak to our, to our clerk over here on our right. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, could we please have a roll call, please? Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Yuri? Yes. You have a quorum. Uh, do we have any speakers uh, either in Zoom or in person? There are no raised hands. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now recess to closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We'll reconvene the meeting at 6.30 to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. So we're ready to go, guys. Let's go. Thank you.
Do they let you out, Norm? Huh? I mean, Lloyd, do they let you out? Well, I can oh, swim to the Dewey's Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I can't get home. I mean, I can't. Yeah, hopefully it's cleared up. Hi, Trevor. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, the October 9th, 2023 regular meeting of the Melville City Council is now called to order. On account of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting is being held in a hybrid format that allows members of the public to participate in person or remotely via Zoom webinar. In-person participants, <clears throat> if you would like to speak, please submit your request to speak form to our clerk over here on our right. Remote participants, if you would like to speak, please join the Zoom webinar meeting printed on the agenda and raise your hand in Zoom when the item you wish to speak on is called. Kelsey, may we please have a roll call? Councilmember Grisanti? Here. Councilmember Riggins? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Here. Mayor Uring? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, Don, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Yes, sir. 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Now you did a good job. Uh, may we please have a closed session report? Yes, Mr. Mayor. At 5.30 p.m., the City Council convened an open session and recessed a closed session. All five council members were present and no reportable action was taken. Thank you very much. Any other report on the posting of the agenda, Kelsey, please? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on September 29th, 2023, with the amended agenda posted on October 6, 2023. Need a motion for approval of the agenda? I have a few um, changes to the agenda I'd like to request. Please. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to ask that we adjourn um, in support of the um, people in Israel and the Palestinians, for that matter, who are not engaged in the hostilities and are innocent victims of all of this. Um, I'd like to ask that we defer item 3B4 to be considered in conjunction with item 5A. I think that they're interrelated. Um, I'd like to ask that we move up item 6A to be heard following the consent calendar. It's twice now been not, we've not gotten to it twice um, after the last two meetings. And I'd like to ask that we continue item 4B to the next meeting. Uh, I can explain why, um, but let's I'm maybe see if we have a straw agreement to do it first. If not, I'll, I'll try persuading everyone with my explanation. Okay, I, I would second the, the first two items you had regarding uh, the, the 6A moving up forward. Let's get Rob, uh, Rob Dubow out of here sometime earlier this evening. I, I would also suggest that maybe a little more explanation on the 4B Okay, so can we vote on 3B4 and 6A first and then deal with the rest? Kelsey, could you call a roll call on those, please? May I make a friendly amendment? Yes. Can we also add 5A and 6B to that? Five Moving a. them up behind the consent calendar. 5A? 5A is the discussion with regards to 3B4. And 6B is the funding for the... Um, Community funding for well, let's find out. I'll be get... pleased to accept that as a, an amendment. Okay, there you go. I'll, I'll second that then. Oh, thank you. So where are we right now? Kelsey, could you? If the second, the mayor accepts the motion, it would be to hear item 3B4 concurrently with item 5A, hear items, and hear items 6A, 5A, and 6B after the consent calendar, I believe in that order. And also uh, to adjourn. Um, um, in, in, for the Palestinian, the, the, the Israeli, Israeli. Palestinians. Middle East issues. In support of Israel and Palestine, for that matter. Okay, Kelsey, you do that, and then we'll come back and do this, the last item. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Yuri? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Motion carries. Very okay, good. so um, with the item 4B, uh, late Friday, I'm not even going to call it afternoon, it was after 5.30, just one business day ago, we received a document, I'm going to call it a document dump of more than 100 pages of material that had been in the city's possession for many months and which was excluded from the original council agenda report for this item that was distributed nearly a month ago and was redistributed more than 10 days ago. And I had asked for those documents more than two weeks ago as well. We got them on Friday. Um, of equal, if not greater significance, Oh, that's right. I, had, I, had, I knew that they were missing and asked for them. Oh, I also asked the planning director um, 18 questions because I had spent hours. I, I probably spent more than 40 hours preparing for that appeal. And I asked a number of questions two and a half, three weeks ago. And I got some of the answers Friday evening at 930. And I got the balance of the answers this afternoon at 4 or 430. I have not had a chance to digest that information. I could do it on the fly while we're sitting here, but I don't think it's appropriate. The other council members haven't even gotten it. And I just think it's unacceptable that we would spend weeks of preparation for a matter only to receive a document dump that was in the possession of the city for many months on the last business day prior to the meeting and receive answers to important questions, which ought to be easy to answer just before the meeting begins. And let me just add to that. Three weeks ago or four weeks ago, I can't remember what it was, I sent an email to Trevor, or to Tyler Eaton, trying to get information uh, regarding this item. And I talked to Richard a week ago. He said he was going to try and make sure that I got answers. And today, I still don't have answers. So I would second the fact that there's still some items out there that we need information on 
to be able to effectively handle this item. Any other comments? Paul. Like you, I received the document dump, but it really wasn't that significant because I was able to sit down and read through it in an hour. It was not tremendously difficult. It was, you know, letters back and forth that, and of course, every time there was the letter back and forth, it also had the other ones that led up to that letter. And it, you know, it was not, I, I didn't see anything there that would make a huge difference in anything, but that's just me. If I could uh, concur, I, I looked at it as well, and I'm not going to say I read it thoroughly, but it was certainly more of a flip. And you, we've been getting dribbles and drabs on this doc on this uh, uh, issue for several weeks, and I still had the stuff from the last meeting when it was uh, scheduled. So I mean, there's a stack of paperwork here that's huge. Uh, for this project, but uh, I'm, a, I'm not so much concerned about what we have received, and I appreciate uh, uh, Councilman Silverstein's work on this because he's always very diligent in what he uh, reviews on this. But I'm more concerned about what you, what the mayor's asked for. Can you yeah. give us some idea of what that, what that topic is, and what, what we're missing? Yeah, I mean, what, what on my, oh, me. one of my questions was the, the. And it goes back to the procedure that was used for the Planning Commission meeting. There was a 2-2 two -two tie that, under Robert's Rules of Order, would have suggested that the motion failed, okay? Uh, now, for, for reasons that I don't understand, the, the, plan, the legal staff at that meeting made the decision that said, well, instead of failing that motion, we'll have it appeal to the City Council. So I just asked, where can I find that in writing? Where can I find the rules? that guide me in terms of how I'm supposed to handle this stuff. If I'm the decision maker, I'm going to make decisions based upon what the rules say. I, so where is the rule that says if it's a 2-2 tie, here's the situation where it's going to be considered a, a, a loss. Here's the situation where we're going to move it forward to the city council. And, and where do I find that? So I understand what the hell is going on. And I can't, it, 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 nobody ever gave me anything on that. All right. If I. Actually, I had the same question as well, and uh, we had a couple of emails in the package from um, our letters from uh, Frank Angel's law firm, and um, I always want to say uh, Gerson and Dreyfus. I hate to say how I know that, but uh, that law firm I knew a long time ago uh, about this issue, and I talked to Trevor, and he had some, um, I think, uh, good comments on that about just what why we have this here tonight without an appeal. Where is it in writing? That's my question. Can we, can we, I'm concerned that we're we, not we getting into the substance we can't of that the debate. issue yeah. itself, because I'm prepared to talk about that when the time okay, comes. Sorry, go ahead. The only sure. application now is to not hear the, 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 gotcha. the, okay. the item tonight. Well, that, Marianne has been trying to speak okay. for a while. Well, I mean, I rewatched the meeting um, yesterday, and I mean, there was a motion by one of the planning commissioners stating that the commission was deadlocked and they didn't see a way out of it. And that motion was made by Craig Hill, it was seconded by Jeff Jennings, and it was passed by a 4-0 vote by the remaining condition, the commissioners. So I guess we, Trevor can yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't us on that. discuss the issue until we're going to call the item. So the question is, you know, there, there's been a request from a couple of council members for a, for a continuance so they, could, they can okay. obtain more information. Um, and you know that's the, the question here before the council whether it wants to continue the item or if it doesn't want to continue it. Bruce, Kit. I'm sorry, Doug, you can go first. Well, I was going to make a suggestion since we seem to have a lot to talk about on this. Can we put this item on the agenda tonight? And if we decide that we're not prepared to carry it forward, let's put it on postpone to the next meeting to satisfy all these. But I would I would rather have a thorough discussion on this than trying to do it on the agenda. Okay. So, just my last comment on my on the motion, I, and I hear I think if I understand what Doug's saying is let's leave it on the agenda. We can always decide when it comes up again whether we should continue it. We also can begin by discussing whether it's properly before us, and we may we may or may not get to the merits. Um, but I just want to say, you know, in response to the point that it took an hour to read a hundred and something pages. It also, I suspect, didn't take 40 hours to read the, for, the, for that council member to read the report and ask questions about it and think about it and do independent research about it 
and delve into this matter deeply. So if it only takes a few hours to look at two or 300 pages, not surprising, it only takes an hour to look at another 100. It took me 40 hours to go through this packet. This appeal has all kinds of su substantive issues, and the 100 pages raise additional issues. Paul. Bruce, you seem to be challenging my ability to read quickly and comprehend, okay. but I will say that I spent quite a bit of time reading the package the last time this was agended, was agendized, and I read it again in preparation for this time. I watched the video of the Planning Commission meeting, and when I got the extra pages that came through and read through that, that was... It was, there was nothing significant there. It was interesting to see the back and forth, but it wasn't really that significant. And uh, one thing I would like to say is Craig's, Craig's motion was remanding it, I believe he said he was remanding it to the city council. And we could, we could find out very quickly what that was, but let's do that when we get to it on the agenda. Okay, anybody else? Uh, you know, just, and I'm not gonna argue about how long it takes you to read whatever you read, uh, but, but when I read it, there were issues that talked about, you know, there were differences in the slope analysis, there were differences in the uh, bluff analysis. So, so there were a number of substantial issues that were presented in some of those, the, the letters that I got or the emails that I got uh, that raise additional questions, which I have not had a chance to go through. But uh, so let's, I guess that right now we're sitting back and saying, should we move this thing off the agenda for tonight? Or should we just leave it on the agenda and discuss it when it comes up later in the evening? Kelsey, give me a roll call. So we, anybody else have anything to say I on think, that I think it's a, a motion. Can we continue to a date certain uh, to avoid the re-noticing? Just so we can be clear about the motion, whether this to a date uncertain or a date certain? No, I was just asking that it be continued to the next meeting. To the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Paul, you, anything else you're on? Done? Trevor? Anything else? Anybody so else? Can we be sure? Can we be sure what the motion is? I want to... It's to continue item six, uh, sorry, 4B to the next regular city council meeting. Kelsey, give us a vote, please. Roll call. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? No. Councilmember Riggins? No. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? No. Motion fails. Okay. Mayor, your microphone. That will move us to ceremonial presentations, and tonight we have a presentation for Fletcher Allen. Uh, so, Fletcher, if you would join me at the podium up here. Let me just state that this, there, there was a tradition to do this in the past uh, at, at a seven year anniversary and uh, pan, the pandemic and all that stuff sort of screwed that up. So I'm just very happy to see that we're getting back to that process and I congratulate you for being the first man to set us on this path to straighten us out what we've been doing. So with that said, Fletcher joined the planning department in September 2016 as a planning technician and now holds the position of assistant planner. He came to us with a master's degree in urban and regional planning from UC Irvine and with years of experience as a planner for cities across Southern California, including various coastal cities. Fletcher specializes in counter services, helping to train over 10 planning technicians and processing permits that require a quick turnaround. As an assistant planner, he works on complex planning decisions or complex planning applications during Fletcher's tenure, he has processed over 850 decisions. Pretty good. Uh, and is responsible for managing over 140 planning applications through the development process. Fletcher also brings to the city expertise with cardi cardi cardiography, 
Did I say that right? Cartographic, okay. Which helped the department in creating overlay maps and utilizing the city's GIS system. It goes without saying that Fletcher was with the city during the Woolsey fire and during the COVID-19 shutdown. He has played an integral part in providing services during the challenging times. And please join me in thanking the assistant planner, Fletcher Allen, for his service to the city. And with that, we're going to present him with this plaque, uh, the Malibu City Council commends Fletcher Allen for a service of seven years and outstanding service to the city of Malibu. And just for what it's worth, prior to this meeting, I had another conversation with Steve McClary to come up with another incentive for you. So when you get, if you get to the 10 year point, what you, what you get to do is have a year, you get to live with John Mazzo for a year. So that, <laughs> wow. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Please say something nice, oh. go ahead, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Um, well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's quite an, quite an honor to uh, to receive this award and this acknowledgement, and uh, you know to to be here all these years and um, be part of the lineage of uh, staff. Um, you know, before COVID, since COVID, it's you know it's been uh, quite a ride. So I'm just happy to be part of it, and um, looking forward to many more years. So, thank you. Thank you for this and that was a joke. Well, you don't get you get six months with John. Okay, uh, the next item on their agenda is a update regarding the separation agreement for Santa Monica Unified School District. Uh, Christine Woods, if you would please join us and give us that update, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Christine Wood. I'm a deputy city attorney for the city of Malibu, and I am here to report on the separation um, from the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. <clears throat> Since my last report to the council, uh, we made significant progress in creating an independent Malibu Unified School District. Um, as you might remember last fall, the parties involved, um, the city as well as Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District entered into an agreement we refer to as a term sheet. Um, and basically it provided a framework for how school separation and the resulting revenue sharing would occur. Um, since last fall, there's a lot that's happened. Um, but I will tell you, we've been able to develop and reach an agreement on a formula that puts into numbers the words in the term sheet, um, which is a really big deal. I'll explain in a moment why. Um, so now the parties have a formula. We've agreed to the formula and all of the inputs to the formula. It's a huge accomplishment because it really provides a methodology for how we'll financially separate from the district. And what's special about that is it's also a methodology that we could provide, let's say, to um, the assessor's office if you know we need them to assist us um, with the um, the allocation and the distribution of property taxes at the time the separation happens. So it's not just a formula that, you know, we understand and, you know, it becomes mysterious. It's a formula that can be replicated and changed depending on um, uh, the current situation at the time of separation. So to be clear, um, there will be a significant annual contribution from the future Malibu Unified School District to the future Santa Monica Unified School District for a defined period of time. Um, it's not as much as our original forecast, um, but it is significant. The upside, however, is that the community of Malibu will accomplish local control. 
uh, without an indefinite contribution payment to Santa Monica. Remember the original forecast, the original requests, um, the original um, agreements provided for a per, um, an indefinite um, permanent redistribution of property taxes from Malibu. That, that is no longer um, the situation according to the term sheet and the formula that supports the term sheet. We've also been able to draft contingency language that provides protection for both future school districts. Obviously, we, we would, at the point of separation, be independent bodies, but um, recognizing we want to still hold on to the basic guiding principles that no school, neither of the two school districts are worse off after separation. So we provided some contingency language that accomplishes that. Um, and the language provides the protection in the case that there are unforeseen circumstances that either cause a significant variance in the projected contribution to the Santa Monica Unified School District or make the contribution unaffordable for the future Malibu Unified School District. So with all of that said, what's next? We're still accomplishing the work in the term sheet. And the, the contingency language and the formula are all part of the revenue sharing agreement that was spelled out in the term sheet. So we're finalizing the revenue sharing agreement and it will be brought um, in the future to this council for a vote in the very near future. We are in the process of drafting an operating agreement that will um, divide the um, assets and the facilities in the district, as well as we'll decide um, and make some determinations about what services the future Malibu Unified School District will provide itself and what services it might have to contract with Santa Monica for, um, for an immediate, um, in the immediate um, time following separation. And then we'll also still have to finalize the joint powers agreement. We've done the heaviest piece of work by finishing, getting very close to finishing the revenue sharing agreement, but there's still some um, the other two agreements that we'll need to finalize. So um, before I finish up this presentation, I wanna just attempt to answer the big question that all of you are wondering. Um, when? <laughs> I am always asked um, how long this process takes. It's something that Mayor Uring, it's something he asked me the, the first meeting we had together after he came to the council, how long does this whole process take? And I will continue to say that this process can take as little as five years and as many as 60 years. There's not a format, there's not a, um, a plan for how this happens. There's not, um, we don't have anyone's shoes to walk in to figure this out. This has never happened between two basic aid districts in LA County. Um, what I will tell you is that we were originally um, at the time of the term sheet hoping for separation and a new Malibu Unified School District by the fall of 2024. Um, we think that's ambitious. There's still a lot of things to happen. Um, even after we reach the three agreements and ratify those um, in the spring, there are still, um, there's still a lot of details. There's a lot of um, process to happen that, that are processes and um, things that we don't necessarily control. There's a state board, there's, um, there's still the, you know, working with the legislators to make this happen. So there's a lot to happen. But um, the district and the city are currently still working together in an effort to accomplish separation by now fall 2026. So I, what I would encourage the public, and I, I've said this to um, the council, I would just encourage everyone to be patient. That doesn't mean we should run out and buy you know, new letterhead. <laughs> um, what it does mean is that there's been a lot of progress made and, um, and, and probably for the first time, the parties are very much committed to separation. We hear it from both sides. There's an optimism that this is going to happen and we're working really hard to make it happen. Um, but please just be patient and um, allow the process to work, allow the parties to continue to get comfortable with the idea and allow the parties to continue to, to negotiate in good faith. Um, and so at that point, um, the city um, and its residents will have an independent school district with local control. I'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Christine. Any questions? Anybody? Christine, thank you very, very much. And just, I have worked with her now for a number of years and, and she's doing yeoman's duty, pushing this rock up the hill. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, finally for the uh, ceremony presentations, a presentation by Yolanda dealing with environmental health programs. So Yolanda, you're on. Good evening, City Council, thank you. Uh, this evening we have before you 
an update for the environmental health and wastewater management. With me is Paolo Quinto, our environmental health administrator. Next slide. The purpose of our city's wastewater management program is to reduce impact and protect coastal water and resources within the city. We do this by reviewing the on-site wastewater treatment systems and make sure that they have their proper design and installation. One of the most critical responsibilities for my department is to protect the public in health and safe, not only of the environment, but also for the water quality. And we do this by our OWTS reviews, inspection, monitoring, maintenance, and enforcing our state and local regulations. Next slide. On reviewing OWTS, we follow the local agency management program. The local agency management program is the Regional Water Quality Board Control Oversight. Our, one of the main obligations for us is to submit an annual report pertaining to the OWTS activities. This is submitted to the Regional Water Quality Board yearly, and we also have another compliance that is done every five years. This is a five-year assessment, a water quality assessment report that includes the overall assessment regarding water quality, impacts from the RWTS, and any recommendations that we may have on our local agency management program. I will pass the presentation to Paolo Quinto so he can go over a few of our metrics and we have accomplished this year. Thank you, Yolanda. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I'm happy to be here. And with the frequent pumping program, environmental health monitors all OWTS frequent pumping activities in the city of Malibu. Per the Malibu Municipal Code 15.44.030, Section C6, when any content of an OWTS has been pumped out three or more times during any 180-day period, the owner of the real property or authorized representative must submit a septage pumping report to the city within 24 hours. All pumping companies are required to register with the city and are required to submit monthly reports to the city by the 15th of the following month. This year, 25 notices have been sent to the homeowners that have pumped three times or more within a 180-day period. Properties that did not reply to the notices were sent to the code enforcement. With the Registered Practitioner Program, all OWTS practitioners provide consistent framework and standards for practitioners in the field of OWTS system design, installation, maintenance, and residuals management. Registration of the practitioners is verified by submittal of an application with proper credentials and coursework. The registration is valid for two years and can be renewed. There are 29 registered installers, 29 registered inspectors, 22 registered designers, and 19 operations and maintenance providers. With the operating permit program, operating permit program serves as continuous maintenance of proper functioning of the ODTS. Homeowners are required to enroll in the operating permit program when a property is sold or has changed in ownership or when an inspection reveals an upgrade or repair is required. Residential properties with conventional system is valid for five years. Residential properties with advanced system is valid for three years. Commercial properties and multifamily is valid for two years. And this year, Environmental Health has issued over 506 operating permits. Currently, there are a total of five septic code enforcement cases, and three are closed. Code enforcement pursues septic violations that include expired operating permits, septic 
repair without permit, septic violations, and expired compliance agreements. The environmental health counter are open daily, Monday to Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., and Fridays, 7.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Staff assist customers regarding the status of their projects. This year, Environmental Health Counter has assisted over 535 people. Environmental Health has received 744 projects. This year, Environmental Health has completed 820 projects. We anticipate to review more projects in the coming months and reach an end of year goal of up to a thousand projects. Some of the major that are currently under review are Jewish Center, Spruzo, Surf Rider Plaza, Mellow Vista Hotel, and HRL. On average, the turnaround time is 11 days per project. Now here is Yolanda to talk about the environmental health accomplishments. Thank you, Paolo. As you see, we had had a very, very busy uh, year. Your environmental health uh, uh, group uh, consists of the environmental administrator and the, also the environmental uh, health um, uh, programs um, analysts. One of the main things that we did this year, besides submitting the reports uh, to for the local, um, for our, I'm sorry, to our regional board, was also the five-year land report that was submitted in April. We also hosted during the August a mandatory meeting for all of the city practitioners. During this um, event, we were, we were happy to have over 50 practitioners attend the, the meeting. We went over guidelines of the inspections for performance of WTS inspections, maintenance, monitoring, and just sharing with them everything that is on our website, on our municipal code, to make sure that we are consistent with enforcing our regulations. During this year, also, we had a code update uh, one of the biggest changes that impacted environmental health was the fixture unit. The city adopted Ordinance 5003 um, with the plumbing code, giving the ability to the community to get credit for the low flow toilet units. Next slide. So looking forward, we have, a, we would like to invite our practitioners the city will be hosting a training for all the registered practitioners to fulfill their continued education. In partnership with the National Association of Wastewater Technicians Trainings, we will focus on inspections of all WTS, also applying the procedures that we learn and how to troubleshooting and maintenance of these inspections. The city is also a member of the Technical Advisory Committee. This committee is com consists of cities and counties and jurisdictions that discuss pertaining on-site wastewater treatment issues. It has very, it been a very busy year, but very thankful the staff has worked professionally and now we have more hours of counter to assist the community. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Well. I just wanted to thank you for your attention to detail and, and how quickly you've been able to respond in the times that I've asked a question during the last year. And that goes to both of you because it's, uh, you guys are very, very responsive and I can't say enough about how professional you are. Thank you. Thank you. I echo Thank what Paul you. says about professionalism and attention to detail. And um, I'm also really excited to hear about that update that the residents are getting credit for the low flow toilets. Uh, that's going to make a, a big helpful thing for people on remodels and such. So everyone should familiarize yourself with that. Are you on this side? No. Okay. Yolanda, Paolo, thank you very, very much. Once again, you have demonstrated your 
ability to help us deal with the environmental issues the city is faced with. So thank you very, very much. You do a heck of a job. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. All right. With that said, we're going to now move to oral and written communications from the public for topics that are not included on this week's agenda. We'll start with the speakers who are here in the room, and then we'll go to the Zoom side. And I may have something to say before we do Zoom, so just before we jump there, let me say what I want to say. Okay, so speakers tonight are Jill Hawkins, and then Joe Drummond, you have a total of five minutes because you've got a, a minute supplied by Maggie Rooney, who's next to you, I think, right? And Ann Doneen. So Jill Hawkins is first, Joe Drummond, you're next, and then David... Good question. H-A-S-S-E-N, Hassan? Okay, gotcha. You're third. Just be ready. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Jill Hawkins, and I'm sorry it took me so long to come introduce myself over the last, you know, few months I've been writing to you guys just to give you guys information as we're all citizens here, we're all human beings, and I have spent a lot of time at the Capitol since 2015, and I like to make sure everyone has informed consent. Um, so I'm here to introduce myself, so you know where I'm coming from. Um, also, I'm, you know, I, the, I, when we have information, we do better. So I don't know if all of you guys know that those kids being denied school, healthy, unvaccinated kids being denied school. So in the last few years, they've been taking away our personal religious exemptions, and I work with a lot of Malibu and Santa Monica folks and people from around the state, thousands. So anyway, the last few years, they've been passing bills, taking away our personal religious exemptions. So healthy and vaccinated kids are being denied school. And you think about this, like a, health, like a person with HIV or hepatitis B have a right to go to school and they can't have an active virus, as they should. But a healthy and vaccinated kid who's not carrying any illnesses, who decides not to take a shot, um, is, are being denied school. So, you know, we, everyone's just talking about equity, inclusion, and, you know, um, you know everyone. So we, we need to include everyone. That includes everyone. So products need to work for the person using them. You know, a lot of the information I've been providing you about the vaccines is that it's been a liability-free product since 1986 because they're going bankrupt from all the vaccine injuries. And so um, they're supposed to form a task force, make them safer, do safe testing, do reports. And Ron Reagan's administration did that. Um, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. sued Health and Human Services. They admitted they did zero of that in 32 years. So the, and it's, there's actually never been. So anyway, products need, people need to choose the products they use uh, for. But anyway, I'm going to share a book with all you guys. You guys will all get a copy. I didn't bring enough to the two on the end, sorry. Um, this is written by Edward Dow. He um, was formerly with BlackRock. You guys probably may know him. He's a statistician. Uh, um, uh, um. So anyway, he, 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 this is not his opinions. These are all just what the, the data is saying from around the world. It is so meticulously done. And it's like done for like dummies. Like you, there's little... Um, little um, you scan codes and it'll take you to every um, information. So what he found out was um, he went with insurance companies. And so when COVID started, they didn't, the deaths didn't go up, but the payouts started to happen after the release of the vaccine. And so, I mean, these are all young people. Everyone in this book is under 45 and there's just been an unexplained deaths of people, young people, athletes. So it's done by chapter by chapter. Look at every, detail, but um, so anyway, I just want us to all have the facts. I want us to all work together to get kid, the healthy kids, unvaccinated kids in school. You know, products need to work for the person using them. There's freedom for all and, you know, make sure we're, we're not segregating, discriminating against, you know, vaccination status. So anyway, I hope you enjoy my time, my emails to be informed. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Okay, Joe, you're up next and you've got a total of five minutes. And David, you're going to follow her, and you've got a minute that donated by Stephen next to you. So you're up next. Why don't you come and grab a seat up front so you're ready to go? Go ahead, Joe. Sorry. Hi, all. Um, I just wanted to shout out Paulo Quinto because he has is the only person that has approved anything for my project, um, <laughs> for my low flow fixture count. So thank you, Paulo, if you're still here. Anyway, honorable city council members, thank you for the opportunity to address all of you on this very serious and urgent matter. And I want to say that I am speaking to you tonight as a private citizen and not the president of Malibu Township Council. 
It was only recently after the last city council meeting that I learned at the, that the letter of Ann M. Ravel, former chair, California Fair Political Practices Commission, County Council of Santa Clara County Chair and Federal Election Commission, and the Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the United States Department of Justice. So now, as a private citizen, I must ask both of you council members, Council Member Grisanti and Council Member Riggins, why are you putting the city in serious jeopardy of legal action and loss of public trust by not removing Chair Peak and Ch Commissioner Smith from the Planning Commission? The code sections cited by Ms. Ravel in her letter clearly show they both have a conflict of interest in every case they hear on this commission, so therefore they can be challenged at all levels. Anne Ravel obviously is an expert in this matter. I also now must question Councilmember Grisanti's motives in appointing a developer to the Malibu Planning Commission, whose decisions as a commissioner would, of course, affect property values, which in turn would affect your real estate business. The city is aware that these two planning commissioners regularly vote through projects where all three of you have a foreseeable financial gain and a bias with other projects regarding the applicant and architect Doug Burgi, with whom the commissioners have a professional relationship. And they also regularly vote to approve friends' projects without disclosure of their relationships or recusing themselves. The future is full of potential financial gain for all three of you which is why you vote everything through. Why would you, as council members, want this FPPC violation and investigation to occur? These planning commissioners need to be removed immediately. Both of these commissioners recently voted through Doug Burgi's environmentally damaging Malibu Inn Hotel project, which can now likely be considered void in a court of law due to their conflict of interest on that project in more ways than one. Based on this alone, Malibu Township Council will be requesting this be returned to the Malibu Planning Department and request their recusal. By virtue of their conflicts, all the project decisions which they have voted on in the past will vote or vote in the future could possibly be voided or subject to lawsuits. Why would you put the city at risk and yourselves as well by having them continue in their positions? If you think you haven't done anything wrong by appointing them, you have now been put on notice that you both are highly mistaken. Commissioner Peek ironically pointed out to the Malibu Times in May that no one would ever be able to vote on anything if they could be held accountable for what happens later on down the line. Of course you all need to be accountable. I've requested at the very least that this be discussed with the, Mal the public at a city council meeting as it is Malibu City's conduct and not a lawsuit and the city council represents the residents and your planning commissioners are supposed to be representing us residents. Planning commissioners Skylar Peak and Dennis Smith are serving themselves and council member Grisanti in the process since they have so far refused to simply step down and neither of you have yet removed them to protect the city of Malibu from possible legal actions and the potential cost. Please, Mayor Uring, do call a special meeting to remedy this matter. Transparency, disclosure, and accountability is in the public interest in this conflict of interest item. City Council needs to take control of this situation with Council Member Riggins and Grisanti recused, obviously. Council policy states, number seven states, whenever possible, when dealing with major issues, you must seek substantial community involvement in the decision-making process prior to taking final action. Trevor Rustin and BBK cannot be attorneys advising in this matter as they are being investigated for FPPC violations, so a neutral attorney who specializes in conflict of interest law needs to be retained as soon as possible. The points I have mentioned are not innuendo, they are facts. A policy needs to be established not to allow contractors or anyone who could benefit financially from development to be on the planning commission. I do hope you council members both reconsider and remove your commissioners so harm does not continue to your reputations, professionalism, and your position as council members. Hopefully the remaining council members will make a policy to remove unsuitable candidates. This will prevent any future lawsuit against the city brought on by these violations. And then the city can respond and inform the FPPC that the issue has been resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. David, you're up next, followed by Jefferson's. Come up, Jefferson, grab a seat so you're ready to go. Go ahead, sir. Okay, greetings you get four to everyone. Minutes. The reason I'm here is that where, after I moved Please here, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I bought a house in Malibu that had both city and ocean view, and I was enjoying it for a while until my 
new neighbor moved in on the south side and he started planting trees that obstructed my view. So I'm not enjoying the view that I was hoping to enjoy it during the move that I did to the Malibu area. And when I, you know, I send them letters that, you know, uh, let me show you the pictures. This is the picture right now uh, on the left-hand side, the large one, and the other ones also too. So this is a present, uh, because most of my view is from the south side that I can both see ocean and city light view. But this is all obstructed by uh, um, Australian willow and also ficus uh, column that you see next to my fence. Uh, could you project the next picture, please? Uh, yeah. The top view uh, picture is what was taken by city, you know, the, to establish the uh, view, and that's all gone. And this uh, tree that you can see in the background there, uh, that is uh, the neighbor's city. So uh, there was no tree at that time in that area. Okay. Sir, if you could click that button again, thank I spoke you. to the uh, neighbor on the phone and uh, I told them about it and says that uh, previous neighbors never um, planted a tree in front of me so that I could see the ocean. Then his answer was he probably didn't have money to do it. Uh, he considered himself a celebrity with, uh, who was very rich. So according to the regulations, I sent him several le certified letters. He ignored all the letters. <coughs> then um, I had to uh, refer to uh, uh, city enforcement. And uh, they first came to my backyard and saw the situation and agreed with me that the tree and hedges weren't there. But uh, later on, they changed their mind and they said, the owner says that I had the tree planted before, so it seems like there was a seed underneath that it was not uh, in the picture. So I'm asking to see what happens in a situation like this uh, when the tree doesn't exist there and later on somebody comes and says, I had a tree there. So that has to be, thank you. So all I want is my view to be restored. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. And, and you know, we do have, uh, I'm sure that Richard and his staff, he, he runs a compliance or the enforcement office also. I'm sure he'll be willing to help you out and see what we can do to help you. Thank you. Okay, Jefferson, you're up next, followed by Kevin Shankman. Kevin, come on up, grab a seat up front so you're cooking. Jefferson, go ahead, please. Good evening, council members. Thank you for your continued service on behalf of your community and all the efforts that you put forward. And I encourage you to continue with transparency. Speaking of transparency, I've been following the issue of the Ann Ravel letter and statement for the Fair P Political Practices Campaign Board. When I was on the council, I served two terms, four years each. My home was raided because I assumed that transparency was something that we all grew up with, and that's what our city councils and our elected people were about. I filed an affidavit stating the discrepancies I had with transparency. The city spent $65,000 reviewing it. There was nothing found. Still, transparency attempted. Transparency denied. The Malibu Times has done a terrific background research on Ann Ravel. I have never met Ann Ravel. I've never spoken to her. I've never emailed her, texted, tweeted, face planted. But she should be respected. After reviewing her, and I know how to Google now, uh, I found out that she's really good at what she does. 
Um, the transparency about Skyler and Dennis, I know both of the gentlemen. Um, I, I ran for office with Skyler. I know Dennis is a professional contractor here in town. Well-respected workers, local businessmen, but I think that that letter merits some oversight. To give you an example of what I had to go through for my transparency, a metro plan to repave Civic Center Way was in the works prior to my occupancy on the city council. I had a property at 23901 Civic Center Way and Trevor wisely suggested I recuse myself from any decisions on a metro bus repaving prior to my occupancy at city council. I agreed with Trevor and BBK. I recused myself. That was for a paving contract that the city wasn't even involved with. So let's try and figure this thing out because it's not going away. And I look to you and the wise people that are at that counter now, taking over from the old folks like us, I'm almost done. The only person that has spent more time in this dais and in this room, besides myself, none of you on that counter up there, is Norm Haney, who I have respect for here. He is the only recidivist that I have respect for in the contracting world other than Dennis and Skyler. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Kevin, you're up, followed by Jake Wingo. Jake, you here? Come on up, grab a seat if you would. And they'll be followed by Tim Ryan. Good evening. Kevin, uh, go ahead, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, particularly because it may or may not impact uh, your efforts with respect to separating a, an independent Malibu Unified School District, I wanted to take this opportunity to give, uh, give you a short update on our efforts um, regarding voting rights in the city of Santa Monica. Um, as some of you may know, um, on August 24th of this year, the plaintiffs, represented by yours truly, uh, prevailed in the California Supreme Court on our California Voting Rights Act case against the city of Santa Monica. Um, the, uh, our trustee area election petition, that's regarding the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board, uh, to convert them to trustee area elections, uh, will be accord, according uh, will be heard by the Los Angeles County Committee on School District Organization in January. Um, God knows that the only thing that that school district wants to do less than separate Malibu is to have trustee area elections. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we will be having a rally at 5:30. PM tomorrow, I'm sorry, five o'clock tomorrow, um, outside of the Santa Monica City Hall uh, to convince that city council to stop its exceptionally expensive, now going on eight year fight against uh, voting rights. Thank you. Kevin, thank you very much. Mr. Lingo, you're up next, followed by Tim Ryan. Tim, were you here? Yeah, can I give my minutes to. I've got somebody given. Oh, to Scott, you're yeah. giving your minutes to Scott. So, Scott, you come on up to grab a seat up front. Sorry, sir, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and fellow council members. Uh, thank you for hearing me tonight. My name is Jake Lingo, and I'm here on behalf of Malibu Little League. I was recently elected the vice president for Malibu Little League, and I wanted to address uh, some issues with regards to field space at Bluffs Park that I know that we were all included on a correspond few correspondence on email this past week. This is difficult. I'm good friends with many of the families that uh, participate with MLS Go, and I wish them and their organization nothing but success. In fact, I've actually sent my children to MLS Go clinics, and I believe they are doing good work in the community. But tonight I'm here as a representative of Malibu Little League and their legacy. Malibu Little League has been a proven trustworthy partner and a nonprofit community-based organization in this town for over 50 years. Doug O'Brien and a group of community members literally built the ball fields of Bluff Parks with their own blood, sweat, and tears. And that's the legacy I have been asked to be a good steward of while I serve Malibu Little League. The city has limited space at Bluffs Park, we all know this, and it has been the primary gathering place for Malibu Little League and AYSO for decades. We work together along with the city to make sure that the fields are cared for, utilizing the manner in which they are contracted, and that they are shared accordingly. 
Paul Bellamy and AYSO have always communicated and worked very well with Malibu Little League. They've been a they have a robust program and coordinating practices is sometimes a challenge, but we always meet that challenge. They are they are at the fields at the crack of dawn every Saturday, lining the fields, wheeling out the goals, setting the flags, and getting the fields ready for play. There are times that other groups use the field, and we always try to make accommodations for everyone to enjoy Bluffs Park, but we should not be expected to do so at the detriment of our leagues. MLS Go has not approached Malibu Little League about field space, but based on the letters that I have seen addressed to the City Council about AYSO, we may run into a similar situation this spring. It seems to me that MLS Go has promised an experience for its members without first investing into the equipment that is needed and securing field space, but now expects use of AYSO's equipment and space to the detriment of AYSO, and that does not seem reasonable. So I'm here to support AYSO and Malibu Little League and ask that the city continue to honor our decades-old tradition of hosting community-based sports leagues at Bluffs Park. We will continue to work with MLS Go or any other organization to share space when possible, but should not have to sacrifice precious field space every time a new organization decides to come to town. We are meeting with Chris Rose this week to discuss the situation and figure out a way that we can help MLS Go and that we can help the city solve this issue. We are proven commodities, we are good stewards of Bluff Park, and we will continue to do our community-based work to provide children of Malibu with a great competitive athletic experience. And thank you for continuing to work with us on making Bluffs Park the best that it can be. And we look forward to working with our continued partnership with the city of Malibu. And I just want to say thank all of you council members for all the work that you guys put in. You do an amazing job. I know it's hard getting all these complaints all the time. I feel like you're never sometimes on the good side of things, but you've been amazing to, towards Malibu Little League, and we really appreciate the relationship that we have with you folks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I encourage you to continue. Keep talking to the other side, see if you guys can work something out. That'd be good. Okay, Mr. Scott Schoenberger. Yes. And you've got four minutes because you got a minute from somebody else. Okay. <laughs> I go. hope to be faster than that. Go. Uh, first off, thank you all. We really do appreciate the support. It's a difficult job that you guys do. I'm, <laughs> you'll never catch me running for your position. Um, <laughs> so I've been with Malibu AYSO for 20 years. It's a 59-year-old program. What we do is we uh, use soccer to train four to 18-year-olds in core to competitive levels. We've always had a positive, strong, good relationship with the city. We've been able to work things through things and issues as they've come up. We use soccer as a tool to teach kids fair, safe play, teamwork, build character, and good sportsmanship. So it's a lot more about those things than it is about just playing a sport. The volunteers are, are trained in child safety. We're trained to watch for concussions. We're trained to watch out for different issues that come up to them, uh, making sure they're safe. Um, we make sure that the equipment is safe. We replace it uh, and make sure that we maintain it. Uh, the equipment is owned by AYSO. Uh, volunteers go through background checks. And we've changed, we faced a lot of challenges throughout the last few decades, um, like he was mentioning about the field space and whatnot. As a matter of fact, in the postseason, we actually don't have any field space. So the postseason teams, I've even taken a team and practiced on, you know, a uh, tennis court. So <laughs> we'd love to have some more field space. That would be great. Um, <clears throat> uh, just wanted to really say thank you guys for your support. I really, really do appreciate it. And with your support, we're helping with the growth of our children. So thank you. Thank you very much. And think about it before we take your name off the voting roll for next election. <laughs> uh, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm more. OK. Followed by Lloyd, followed by Paul Bellum. Good evening. I'm here on behalf of AYSO as an executive board member, and we're here in response to um, issues submitted by MLS Go Views FC, following up on some of the comments just heard by Scott Schonenberg from AYSO and Jay Klingo. Um, AYSO uh, submitted a response to these complaints, and the statement follows. Malibu AYSO has a long-standing community service agreement with the city of Malibu to provide a fall soccer program to our youth ages 3 to 18. 
and has provided such a program to the Malibu community for multiple decades. We value this partnership with the city and, how we, and have always been in good standing. As volunteers, we have consistently and diligently worked with the city regarding their own programs and also other important external events like Ride to the Flags. We often volunteer with the school community at such events like Elementary School Field Day, and we also maintain a good relationship with the Malibu Little League, collaborating for the benefit of our community. As part of the Community Service Agreement, AYSO is allowed to store equipment at Bluffs Park under the following city requirements. AYSO owned equipment should be stored in a locker container. AYSO goals can be stored outside provided they are locked at the agreed location. AYSO provides the city any keys or lock combos to the above. Malibu AYSO provides the city with our enrollment details, demographics, and schedules as and when required and does not have any input into the city field's permitting process beyond the above agreement. The recent issues regarding equipment usage by other programs, in particular the AYSO own goal, seem to have caused a problem and led to some unfortunate comments and untruths circulating in the community. However, as can be seen from the above, Malibu AYSO is following the required protocols. The goals are purchased, maintained, and periodically replaced at considerable cost by Malibu AYSO. Therefore, it is not acceptable for another program to expect the right to use AYSO's expensive equipment without consideration. Malibu AYSO has never been formally approached by any organization, including the City of Malibu, to use AYSO goals. Therefore, any use of the goals to date has been without permission. If we are approached on this matter, AYSO would follow procedures to review any proposal and seek any subsequent approval from the relevant organizational level. We are a proven commodity, use centered, community driven program and will continue to remain stewards of Malibu. Thank you for your time and we appreciate this uh, wonderful relationship we've had with the city of Malibu as well as with Malibu Little League and we hope to continue that relationship as we move forward for our children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Lloyd, you're up next, followed by Paul Bellum. Paul, are you there? Come on, grab a seat. You're on, Lloyd, please. Good evening, council members. My name is Lloyd Ahern, and I want to talk about tomorrow morning's uh, A&F meeting with uh, Doug and Bruce, and I'm sure Steve McClurry. Um, I spoke last uh, city council meeting about the fact that the cam cameras and lighting monitors and sound in this room were affected drastically by not being used by COVID and during the time of COVID. So tomorrow morning when you guys, I'm going to go to a 10 o'clock uh, physical therapy appointment and I can't break that. So I've got to implore you guys, the amount of money that you're being allocated or asked to vote on, I think is in the ballpark. But if there's any way you guys can put a little caveat on that if you need more, do it all at once. Don't do it piecemeal. And the one thing I learned in the motion picture business for over 50 years was it's a lot cheaper to do it right the first time. Because when you do it wrong, it's like it's a disaster and it's very discouraging. And this background that I didn't point out last time, it's black. I wore my own lighting, my white shirt. So I'd stand out from that. We got to get something to fix that too. So we could put that in the, uh, in the uh, budget. And um, when anybody like uh, the young lady over here that usually shows up with a dark hat and no light on her face, she got smart and wore a white hat and wore it. So people shouldn't have to think of their wardrobe when they come here because it should be lit correctly. The background should be correct. And the people that watch this on tape and the people that watch us live should see and hear us. And also, there should be another camera up there that goes on to Steve McClary when he talks and gives talks to you guys. His body language goes this way. When Trevor talks to you guys and gives you legal advice, we want to hear it too. He talks this way. Put a camera there, goes into his face. Then, when Joyce Parker gave an unbelievable speech that took half an hour of, of that whole thing about alternate housing or whatever it was, we never saw, all we saw, there's a camera somewhere up here that did a profile on her. You gotta see somebody's mouth, you gotta see their eyes. That's how you communicate. Mouth, eyes, camera in their face. So we need a couple more cameras on top of it. So the amount of money you got is good, but it might not be good enough. And just think it's cheaper to do it right the first time. Thanks. 
Thank you, Lloyd. And you can see we, we took your advice. We made it a little bit better this time than it was the last time. So yes, we're working on that. Yes. Yes. Paul, you're up. Followed by John. I'll follow. Yep. Come on up, grab a seat, please. Go ahead. Your on, sir. Hello, I'm uh, Paul Bellamy. I'm c the current um, elected president, uh, commissioner of AYSO in Malibu. Um, I don't want to duplicate some of the stuff that's already been said by my um, volunteer board members. Um, but yes, established in 1964, I'd just like to um, elaborate on the program. It's, it's a nationwide program. It's a non-profit. We operate under one um, tax code nationally, so we are scrutinized very heavily from the top down. Um, there's almost half a million players nationwide, split across 28 United Hubs, 14 sections, 100 areas, and then 900 regions, of which Malibu is one. Um, we offer multiple play levels um, from regional leagues inside Malibu to inter-regional leagues, inter-area leagues, regional championships, area championships, sectional championships, even national games. Um, as, they've, as mentioned, we've followed everything we've done for decades and we've done nothing different this year than we've done before. We respect our community service agreement that we have in place with you um, since around about 2012, I believe. Um, we followed both national, local and City of Malibu guidelines uh, throughout this season. And we also work very closely with Malibu Little League, who have said some nice words tonight, also the City of Malibu and the school district, uh, sorry, the, the local schools in terms of um, sharing um, resources and time and maintaining fields and donations. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. John, you're up next. My name is uh, John Alfano. Uh, I am the current president of Malibu Little League uh, of, of this year. Um, I want to thank the city for everything you guys have done uh, over the last couple of years in supporting us in our nonprofit program of volunteers and parents. Um, we got a lot of things happening great on the field, snack shack, that type of stuff, and the park and the bluff has really become home for a lot of families here, and it's been a really amazing experience. Um, we're here also in support of AYSO and their agreement, along with our agreement with you guys in the city and the support. Um, there's a lot of parents and a lot of volunteers that go into these programs that make them happen, and it's been good. Um, I, I just want to say that there's a lot of work that even goes in the field on a volunteer level. Uh, myself personally and many others have shoveled more dirt on that field than we'd like to ever, more than I do at home. My wife wants me to mow the grass more and I do it more at the field. But that being said, I just, I wanna work something out that time is and space is an issue. The community is growing. There's lots of kids. There's great programs. There's adult softball that the city's putting on. And every day it's just, schedule and time. Um, we're out of season right now, but we have a great fall ball league. Uh, we pay an extraordinary amount of money to use the field during fall ball season, not in spring, but there's a lot of things that go into making this happen and just want to support the things that the city has to offer and the volunteer programs for the kids. And thank you guys for your support. John, thank you very much. All right. Uh, that is the last speaker slip I have. With that, we're going to go to the Zoom calls. Anybody? Oh, yeah, I've, I've just, uh, there have been, well, we've been hit the last couple of meetings with uh, bombers, I guess they call themselves, that are speak, trying to come in and speak on topics that are not on the agenda. We're going to be very diligent of that and cut them off as fast as we can. So please, if you call, if you want to speak in Zoom, Stay on topic. If you don't stay on topic, we're going to try and cut you off and move to the next speaker. Kelsey, what do we got? Mayor, just to clarify, since this is for public comment, but it's not on the agenda, you're going to be cutting off speakers who are disrupting the public that, meeting? That is correct, as fast as we can. Uh, there are 12 raised hands. First is Hovsep. Parker, if they're not responding, we should move on to the yeah, next move speaker. On to the next one. <clears throat> Howard Rudsky. Howard, go ahead. Good evening. Good evening. Sorry I didn't get in on last Wednesday. I tried, but you know, I understand the problems that you guys were having. You know, I wanted to say that I liked a lot of what was said about what we should do as a city. 
But the first, middle, and last problem is staff. We need to get staff and retain staff and have it in a way that staff wants to be here for the amount of time they want to be here. And it used to be that staff came, worked here for five, seven years, and got to be the head of a department at another city. Like look at Beverly Hills, Pasadena, Thousand Oaks, Santa Monica. The list goes on. The traffic and the drive has not changed. What's changed is the way that elected officials, appointed officials, and the citizens treat staff. And this is their career. This is their job. And when we do what we do on video and audio, and anyone can look at it, this is the big deterrent. And so I'd like to ask that if something can be done about that, because we really need to have great staff. This meeting, the last meeting, and even for that, people say staff didn't do this, staff didn't do that. Well, that's because there's a lack of staff. You know, there's only so much they can do. And if you pile on the workload and then public records requests, you know, it doesn't make for a good work environment. So I just like to say that, I'd like everybody to be aware of it. And I know people said nice things about staff, but words are words. Actions mean a lot more. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Howard. Next speaker, please. Paul Miller. Paul? You out there? Hello, can you hear me? We Go. can hear you. Hello, I'd like to speak on agenda line 6B. There are many positives to our mission. There are a few items that I asked the city council mission to take advice from. This is for 6B? Yeah, you, you we haven't called that yet. Just, we, when we get to see, we're going to bring up 6B later in the meeting. You can speak on it then. That would be more appropriate. Ryan. Thank you. I wanted to uh, mention that um, the issue um, of the Planning Commission and the tie voting um, is something that is anticipated by the Municipal Code in one of the other uh, Council of Government cities um, to which Malibu is also a member. And that is uh, that the Council appoints a, a sixth Planning Commissioner as an alternate commissioner. So when a planning commissioner is unable to fulfill their duty, they could be, I don't know, out of the country or ill, or maybe they're conflicted in uh, you know, approving a, their neighbor's house or something, that the alternate can fulfill the role and you have a, the normal number of minds and brains working to analyze an issue and vote on a project. So I wanted to offer that, and I, I think that um, it has merit, uh, considering the current issues that are being discussed with uh, conflicted planning commissioners, that that could be an option. And the number of alternate members could be two. I'm not so sure I'd recommend that, but uh, that is the scenario for the architectural review panel of one of the COG cities as well, is that they have two alternate members in case any of the two panelists are not able to participate. So they keep their business going. They don't end up with this tie vote or we can't get a quorum and, uh, you know, or whatever, uh, canceling meetings because people are out of town. So it just keeps the business of the city going. And I would suggest you consider that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Next speaker, please. Matthew North. Matthew. Calvin, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, I have a short preface to uh, my point. It is, uh, now what I maintain, ladies and gentlemen, the whole thrust of my speech tonight will be that you cannot have an educated opinion, you cannot manage the affairs of a so-called democracy unless you are given all the facts. If you are denied some of the facts, or if the facts are twisted and misrepresented, then you cannot possibly guide the ship of state any more than a navigator could guide a ship if you deprived him of the information of his latitude and longitude, the speed of his ship, and so forth. You have got to let people know the facts of the matter, no matter how shocking the facts may be, before you can judge correctly. 
And I maintain that most people who are liberals, and I found that they are sincere, dedicated and sincere people are liberals, and most of them in the academic, academic community are liberals. The reason is that the facts that they are given leaves them no choice. Now, the reason for it, ladies and gentlemen, I maintain, as I've said, is that you are deprived of facts. Your minds work in many ways like a computer. You're not exactly like a computer, but your minds work like a computer in this respect. If you feed into a computer false information, you know that you are not going to get out good solutions. If you feed lies into a computer, you're going to get lies and false information out. If you neglect to put information into a computer, you, get, you can't get valid answers. Your minds work the same way if they, are, if they have some way of keeping you from the knowledge. I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I messed up. I'm getting kind of nervous because I don't speak publicly very often. But the point of all of this that I'd like to get to is that I was looking at some FBI, um, the National Incident... Uh, I'm sorry, the National Incident Based Reporting System. And what I saw in there is actually pretty shocking. Um, and it's that there's a group of people that one in 22 of them will commit murder at some point in their lifetime. And that same group of people, that's the males, the females commit murder at a higher rate than even white males do. Now that group is the blacks. And I just want to know what this city council is going to do about- Okay, you're starting to move away from what we started with. So let's go to the next speaker. Bill Sampson. Good evening. Uh, I, I'm speaking uh, briefly about the FPPC problem. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, at least two of the council members said, well, by the way, aren't you innocent until you're proven guilty? Well. I don't know if that was designed to intentionally mislead people or not, but the fact is it probably did. Uh, that's a concept of the criminal law. Uh, I don't for a minute believe that either of the planning commissioners involved in this have committed any crimes. I have no reason to believe it at all. I don't think anyone else does either. But that's not the standard. We're not accusing them of a crime. Uh, if the standard is you can't, you, you get to hold the office unless we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you did something bad, uh, we'd probably have OJ on the planning commission. Well, that isn't the standard. You're supposed to have the presence of virtue, not absence of vices. We need virtues, we need to be able to prove it. You're supposed to be purer than Caesar's wife, as it were, and I don't think that has anything to do with the presumption of innocence. Purely a criminal law concept. We're supposed to have the best we can get. We're supposed to have them follow the best ethics they possibly can. If there's even a hint that someone may benefit, or even it appears that they do, they shouldn't be in the job. Uh, you don't want to go to court uh, with a case where a judge owns stock in the company that's on the other side. You just can't do that. Most judges, I'll set aside the current U.S. Supreme Court, uh, would step aside and recuse themselves in such an instance. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the gist of the FPPC complaint. Uh, there are people with more expertise in this, but the idea is uh, let's not even have the appearance of a potential conflict. We will all be better off. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next speaker, please. Henry. Henry, you out there? Keep us on track, Henry. If they're not responding, we should just move forward. Yeah, move along. Christopher. Christopher. Keep them moving. Next one. Yep. Randy. Randy. Randy's in with Christopher. Keep them moving. Craig Hill. Craig. Well, I had to unmute so quickly there. Uh, good evening, council, and mayor, and staff, and everybody. Um, I was contacted by one of the folks involved in the Christmas crash. After 60 years, they should be so grandfathered that some could have Santa Claus beards if they wanted. Yet suddenly the city is asking them to pay a thousand bucks for four hours of permit review 
If some review is somehow necessary after all these years, maybe it could be done in less time or at lower cost. Hopefully Richard or Rob can have some follow-up on this for them. Meanwhile, the uh, council's discourse around conflict of interest so far has involved some irrelevant speculation. What matters is that a plausible complaint has been filed by an attorney with impeccable credentials who evidently does this sort of public interest advocacy. We should be focusing on the merits. If the complaint is accurate, we need to make some changes. If it's substantially incorrect in some regard, let's hear it. Again, no active misconduct need be alleged. The gist of the law is that development professionals shouldn't be voting on development applications, even if, if there's even a chance they could experience a financial benefit more so than the general public. The actual language in the code contains a series of criteria, each more broadly inclusive than the next. It says they must recuse if there's a realistic possibility that they'd have an opportunity to be eligible to compete on a bid. By analogy, they're deemed to be in the game if they're even remotely close to the stadium. And in a community of our size, they can expect to be realistic participants in the market. Now, I don't look much at social media, but I hear that supposedly I've been calling for the commissioners to resign. No, I haven't, and I'm not now. It's remarkable how people can have so little discernment when they just want to believe something. And similarly, the fact that I and several others have been listed as witnesses doesn't mean we're complainants. Presumably, it's because we're close enough to the situation to provide some facts for the FPPC. What I have pointed out is that once a complaint has been filed, the FPPC has a process. And if I understand correctly, it looks like the commissioners should recuse at least temporarily until a determination is made. The reason for that is that any decision they participate in could be invalidated and the city could be liable for the foreseeable effects. I don't know how long an FPPC decision takes. That would be good to find out. If it's like other state agencies, it could be several months or more. And so echoing Ryan, maybe one solution might be to appoint temporary alternates who'd serve for however many months until the preferred commissioner is clear. I think that residents uh, and developers alike deserve a more predictable process, which means being confident that decisions are being made by those eligible to make them. And then finally, on the tie vote thing, I'll just note that uh, I only voted to send it to council because the city attorney told us that we were required to do so. So I hope that clarifies that. Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys around. Thanks, Greg. Any other speakers? Alicia Peake, followed by Mary Fagan. Alicia? Hi, my name is Alicia Peak. Um, I'm here. I'm not here to talk about my brother. I believe the investigation um, will move forward. But I am here to thank all of you on the council for everything that you do, and I am so grateful to you. And I just wanted to talk about how hard the community services staff has been working, and I just want to make sure that they are appreciated and thanked. We've been dealing with a lot of controversy at the pool and now dealing with bluffs. Um, I don't think the city staff is put in the right situation here because these are feuding entities that really should have nothing to do with the city, in my opinion. And my hope is that these organizations can talk to each other in a calm and kind manner and stop the visceral attacks on each other. Um, I just think we live in a small town and kindness goes a long way and reaching across the aisle is so important. And I think we owe it to our children and the youth organizations to set that example. Um, and I really hope, you know, the Marlins and the Seawolves that we can work it out with them as well as views and AYSO. Um, I believe in people and I believe that hopefully that there can be a solution. Um, and I just wanna commend the city staff for everything that they've dealt with on that front. I also think to the council, this really highlights we need a pool we need more field space, right? Like we, there's a big facility use problem for the youth in this town. So if anything to me, all of these issues, that's what it highlights. Um, I continue to fight for them on my Parks and Rec Commission. Um, but anyway, I'm just thankful to all of you and I really hope we can all approach each other uh, with kindness and try to reach across the aisle because I do believe that we are all here to support this community. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, good, good message. Next, please. The last speaker is Mary Fagan. Mary. 
All right. Okay, that's it for the evening then. Cool, thank you very, very much. That's good. All right, let's bring it back up to the council table. The city manager, you're on, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I have to give my report this evening. Uh, one thing I know that we've been tracking for several months now is uh, AB 1500. Uh, which I'm very happy to, to uh, report was signed last night uh, by the governor. Uh, so that was a, a great news, I think, for everybody who was impacted by the Woolsey fire. Again, AB 1500 is going to extend the uh, property tax exemptions for properties and homes that were damaged or affected by the Woolsey fire. So that the, the uh, AB 1500 has an emergency provision. It will kick in November 1st and will, it will extend uh, those property tax uh, exemptions for an additional three years. Uh, so I uh, want to thank uh, Assemblymember Irwin's office and her staff for uh, their work and for sponsoring this legislation. Also, a quick shout out to our folks at Cal Strategies for their assistance on, on moving this forward as well. Uh, it's not often that you can easily get a bill through the legislation legislature this easily and without any issues. Uh, and we were happy to uh, to uh, to take the ride on this one. So good news there. Um, I also want to report that uh, last week, uh, the Deputy City Manager, Alexis Brown, and I met with uh, the staff of uh, Supervisor Horvath. Um, we've had a lot of really good interactions uh, with uh, the Supervisor's staff since she came on board about a year ago. Uh, they're really making a good effort to, uh, to work with us and to make sure that they're paying adequate, sufficient attention to the Malibu community. Um, we talked about a variety of issues with them, including uh, their support for the farmer's market, um, emergency preparations and communications, uh, safety on Pacific Coast Highway and in the local canyons. And um, I think we're just really have established a good working relationship with them. Uh, we also had a brief conversation with them about uh, trying to work a little bit more with our telecom communicate uh, companies to make sure that they have um, adequate emergency generator response uh, so that when we go into an extended uh, public safety power shutoff or some other emergency, uh, that we're able to get those cell phone towers up and running as soon as possible. So we know that's a key part of communication. Uh, attended last week uh, the meeting with the Environmental Subcommittee, uh, Sustainability Committee, excuse me, where we heard an update on Dark Skies implementation uh, and the good progress that they're making there. Uh, we will be coming back to the group with some uh, possible recommendations on modifications there, uh, but again, some good progress. Um, as uh, one of the speakers mentioned, we do have an administration and finance uh, meeting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Couple items on there. One, talk about the Trancas uh, Park restoration and also to allocate some additional money for uh, the crew that's helping us with the, uh, with the broadcast, uh, with the meeting broadcasts. Um, also want to report, and we will be putting out a, a press release on this, uh, but the city did submit comments to the Federal Aviation Administration uh, regarding for its noise policy review. We submitted those comments on September 29th. Uh, we've urged the FAA, FAA to adopt rules that would reduce aircraft noise that Malibu residents have been experienced since the FAA implemented its next-gen flight procedures at Los Angeles International Airport. So we'll keep posted as we, uh, as we uh, continue to track that matter. Um, we're also working on putting out a press release on the adoption of the uh, city's six-month goals. Thank you to the council for uh, your support on that. And then also wanted to give a quick shout-out to our uh, public safety director, Susan Duenas, who gave an in-depth report on what the city has been doing to get better prepared since the Woolsey fire. Uh, she gave a great presentation at Friday's business roundtable meeting. Um, so just wanted to, uh, to thank Susan for that report. Also happy to uh, announce that the, uh, we have put out a request for proposals for the community engagement on the use of the city's vacant property. So that is out and we are seeking proposals. So that will be to find a consultant that will help us with the outreach to the community and figure out what we're going to do with those vacant properties. A couple of announcements from um, our community services department. Uh, the Halloween animated classic, The Adams Family, will be shown at Malibu Bluffs Park this Friday, October 13th. Admission is free. The movie begins at sunset and pre-event activities begin at 530. Attendees are encouraged to bring blankets and chairs. 
Also, the Malibu Speaker Series continues on Wednesday, October 18th at 7 p.m. at City Hall with, Arthur, with author David Quammen, who will discuss his two recent books, Breathless and The Heartbeat of the Wild. An RSVP is required to attend the event. Uh, please visit malibucity.org slash library speakers for more information. I also want to report that our Environmental Sustainability Department will have an outreach booth at the uh, Farmer's Market coming up on October 15th. And also just wanted, it's been a while since we reported on the rebuild statistics from Woolsey Fire. Uh, to date, we have issued uh, 272 issues, uh, building permits for single family homes. 143 single family dwellings are complete. And we've issued 18 uh, building permits for multifamily and 12 multifamily building units are complete. And, um, for my last thing for this evening, as I noted at the at the meeting two weeks ago, um, I am preparing a report into what happened with the special event permit uh, that was issued uh, for the event that occurred on September 22nd. I should have the report um, completed and issued out by the end of the week. I'll make sure that that's uh, made available to the city council and then also uh, to the public. Uh, there are a couple things that I did want to report, though, preliminarily based on what we found as part of that analysis. And again, this will all be in the complete report as well as some additional questions and answers. So again, the event in question occurred September 22nd uh, at 26731 via Linda Street in Malibu. And one of the things that we looked at was try to determine if the permit was properly issued in conformance with city code and policy. Uh, we did find that it was. Um, the application process and approval sometimes occur the day uh, before the event, and if all information is order, uh, permits can be issued. Uh, that was the case for this event on Via Linda Street, uh, where the city staff was contacted by Councilmember Silverstein uh, as the event was being set up beside his residence. Um, city staff contacted the event planner and directed them to complete the permit application, which they did the day before the event, and then it was issued. Um, the event organizer did not indicate that the event was for promotional purposes. However, uh, there is no difference in the requirement for permitting, whether there's a product promotion or not. Uh, we did find that the signature on the application was notarized. We did not find that any favoritism or deals were given to the applicant. Uh, the applicant followed the same process as any other applicant would do to, to receive a permit. Uh, the applicant uh, did identify themselves as the owner of the property. Uh, staff was made aware of the celebrity association of the event, but at first we were not aware that it was for the promotional company Poosh. The event was treated the same as any other event. Uh, due to the location and size of the event, city staff conditioned the event organizer to provide offset parking, a parking shuttle, private security, and other stipulations. We also took a look back to see uh, how many permits in, have been issued in the past five years, uh, issued by the city, and how far in advance those were issued. Uh, we found going back to 2019 that there'd been a, there's been a total of uh, 186 special event permits uh, issued, and 10 of those were submitted the day prior. We also found uh, upon review of the event, after the fact, the code enforcement manager did feel that the negative impact of the neighborhood was sufficient uh, to merit a six month restriction on the property, which will not allow special events at this site during that period. So again, I'll have a, a full report out to the council by the end of the week. We have to answer any questions, and I know we have uh, Sergeant Soderlund as well from Lost Hills uh, for our Sheriff's Department report. Any questions for the city manager? Does that bring the sergeant up? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, city council members. Um, I have the uh, September crime stats for the city of Malibu. Um, so year to date through September, there's been 352 part one crimes, which compares to 389 year to date from 2022. So that's a 37 um, incident decrease, which translates to negative 9.5% crime reduction uh, year over year. So. We got through summer and uh, we're still below trend line, so I'm happy to see that. Uh, a couple highlights um, from September. 
Um, <clears throat> a Malibu transient was arrested for assault and criminal threats on Pacific Coast Highway, and the suspect attacked the victim for unknown reasons. Reasons. Uh, a transient was arrested for theft and trespassing on Sweetwater Canyon Drive. The suspect climbed over the fence and entered the backyard of the location and turned on multiple water hoses for some unknown reason. Um, in another incident, a transient was arrested for arson on Pacific Coast Highway. The suspect set multiple pieces of torn cardboard on fire. In another incident, a Malibu transient was arrested for theft and vandalism on Civic Center Way. The suspect entered the location, selected store items, and exited without paying. A store employee stated that the suspect entered the business three times that day and each time stole store items. Um, and finally, uh, there were eight vehicle incidents, seven vehicle burglaries, and one theft from an unlocked vehicle, uh, which occurred on Pacific Coast Highway in the areas of the Malibu Lagoon and Surfrider Beach areas. Uh, some of the victims placed their vehicle keys underneath their vehicle or nearby. And when they returned, the vehicle keys were missing and property was stolen from inside the vehicles. In seven instances, the stolen credit cards uh, were used by unknown suspects to make unauthorized purchases. And property stolen consisted of cell phones, wallets, credit card, debit cards, vehicle and house keys, fanny packs, and cash. So um, we still see a lot of vehicle burglaries, and I just want to remind people to hide your valuables, take them with you, don't leave your key fob on the top of your tire if you're going to go surfing. They watch from a distance and see you do it and are able to get into your car. Um, <clears throat> I also want to report that the uh, Malibu Triathlon went on with uh, no major issues or problems, uh, so that was nice to see. We were ready to go uh, on short notice, so everything went smoothly um i want to give you guys an update about the uh, barrel murder the body in the barrel in the lagoon um i can't give too much detail but i can say that our homicide bureau has made significant progress in solving that case and hopefully soon they'll be able to share the details with you but um, they've made significant progress um Unfortunately, last night there was a fatality here on Malibu Canyon, just up the road here by the, the church. Um, a, the driver was driving at a high rate of speed and lost control and hit a power pole. Um, went over the side and was ejected and killed. Um, speed, again, was the primary factor in this. So just want to remind everybody to slow down. The speed limits are there for a reason. Please obey them. Um, and our, my last topic I'm going to talk to you guys about, uh, zero bail policy has started uh, on October 1st, so uh, nine days ago. So prior to October 1st, if you were arrested for a misdemeanor or felony, you uh, were entitled to bail, which is a condition of your release to appear in court. Uh, the court basically said that Having a uh, financial means, some people do, some people don't, and it's unconstitutional. So they've introduced this zero bail policy. So um, only serious and violent felonies uh, will be kept in jail, and everybody else gets released on a citation to appear in court. So that's what we're working with now. Sheriff, thank you very much. Talk to these judges, will you? I mean, this is... <laughs> yes. I have just a couple questions. One, when, when you say transient, are you referring to unhoused individuals or are you just referring to somebody passing through? Uh, unhoused individuals. Okay. And, and they're unhoused individuals who didn't become unhoused in Malibu. They, they came, to be, came to Malibu to stay unhoused. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, the body in the barrel. Um, are you able to tell us whether the body became deceased in Malibu. I don't have that information. Okay. And then lastly, zero bail. Um, if someone is arrested while out on zero bail, does the zero bail continue to apply or does that then start a different issue? So it depends on what they're arrested for the next time. If they're out on zero bail on one thing, if what they're rearrested for qualifies for zero bail, they'll get another citation. Okay, thank you. Yes. Steve, go ahead. How about the last 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, the sergeant reminded me we are bringing an item to the council at the next regular meeting to discuss the uh, zero bail policy. So sergeant, that will be coming for sergeant. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mary Ann. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is there signage out at Surfrider and at the other public beach locations to remind people? I know that we have them on the changeable message signs. But anything to remind people that don't leave your key fob on your... So Surfrider is a state park okay. area, so they have their own signage. But um, we have that electronic billboard on Malibu Canyon as you come into Malibu to remind people. And we also have the, the science, but... Yeah. As you know, we need Coastal Commission permits and everything to put signs up. So, Well, just everybody spread the word out there. Yes. You know, take care of your, your belongings. Paul, anything? Yeah, I just want to thank you for the, for the report and your attention to detail. And I, I'll take this opportunity to tell people that your key fob, if it's on your car tire, they can just open the door anyway. They don't even need to grab the key fob. So that hiding key fob is a bad idea. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that the COG had a meeting about the zero bail thing, and I'm sure it will come back as an agendized item at the next meet, city council meeting. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> Doug, anything? I'm good. You're Doug. Okay. Uh, thank you very much again. The speeding stuff, I mean, and you may hear this, I live up on the knolls up here, and Friday and Saturday night, PCH is like the Pocono Raceway. I mean, it's just amazing. And I have no idea how fast this guy was doing that, that went over the cliff yet, last yesterday in Malibu Canyon, but he had to be flying. Because apparently he turned over, hit the pole, and still went over. So, you know, anything anything you guys can do to slow these guys down would be appreciated. And just, we talked to, in, in our meeting this morning, the uh, ordinance dealing with speed cameras all right, is going to the governor to be signed. And if that gets signed, it's going to be a, a, uh, a test case in a bunch of cities. And hopefully if that works, we'll get it here in Malibu right after that. So that may help us in the long run. Thank you very much. We need them. So. We need them. I yes. hear you. Anything else, guys? All right. Any commission or uh, committee updates? Kelsey? No, you don't have any commissioner committee updates. Okay, let's go back to the city council table and see what everybody here has to say. I started that way last time, so Paul or Bruce, let me start your side this side, if you would, please. Sure. So um, I'm not going to go through what I've been doing for the past two weeks. There's a lot going, other than preparing for that um, hearing that we're going to have later. I want to thank the public speakers as well as the um, those who submitted written comments. I'm not going to go through those um, comments tonight one by one as I normally do, um, but the broader subjects I'm going to address, we'll touch on them. Uh, when the original agenda was posted for this meeting, uh, we were supposed to have a closed session respecting the lumber yard, which would have addressed, I understand, a possible assignment of the master lease for the property, uh, and which would have potential implications for the formula retail ordinance that's come into focus on account of certain activity at the lumber yard involving James Purse, which rumor has it may be the potential assignee. I don't know if that's correct or not, but I know we were supposed to hear something about an ass a potential assignment. Then a couple days ago, item 7A of the next planning commission meeting, which is a receive and file matter, um, was posted. The, um, it, it's a receive and file staff's presentation on formula retail clearance. The Planning Commission agenda report is a single page with the discussion being the following in its entirety. Staff will provide a presentation explaining the Planning Department's application of formula retail clearance. That's the report. Um, that's an inadequate discussion for the Planning Commissioners or the public. I know they're going to produce something or they're going to they're going to say something at the meeting, but that's an inadequate presentation in advance of a meeting to allow the members of the City Council the, I'm sorry, the planning commissioners, the public, and members of the city council who are part of the public to prepare for that discussion. Plainly, an oral presentation can't be received and filed. There must be a written presentation, and it should be provided with the agenda so that the planning commissioners and members of the public can educate themselves in advance of the meeting. The written presentation also would be helpful for the city council when considering the item that originally was scheduled for the closed session meeting tonight which I'm assuming will be coming back to us at a future meeting, perhaps even the next meeting. In that regard, I've performed my own analysis of the proper application of the formula retail ordinance, 
which I suspect will be more restrictive than the planning department's application, which I will not know for certain until the planning department's presentation is prepared and made. So this is a long way of saying because the staff report for the coming planning commission didn't include a written presentation, and because this is an important issue to the city council, I want to ask for consensus that we direct the staff to table item 7A of the planning commission agenda, prepare a written report, and present it to the city council for discussion at our next meeting, or at least in advance of our closed session with respect to the lumber yard. And I wonder if I can get a consensus on that. I will agree to that. I mean, I, that was my suggestion when I saw it, that it should come to the city council first to determine what the policy is before it goes to somebody else. So I'm in favor of that. Anybody else? No? I'll go along with that. Can, uh, can we hear something about why it was is being sent to the Planning Commission? Did the Planning Commission ask a question about that? Is that what's causing that to be added? Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, council member Grisanti, I believe, is correct that there was a request by, and I can, I'd have to pull the minutes to find the specific commissioner, but there was a, quest, a request that staff present the, the formula retail review process to the commission, and that is why that was placed on the agenda. All right, well, I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with the fact that the staff was planning to present that. I'm just asking that it be presented to us and that it be done before we deal with the assignment of the master lease so that we can understand the issues. And I think we have a consensus of three people so far. The, the, the potential closed session uh, does not deal with the formula retail ordinance. It only deals with price and terms, so they're not connected. That's your view that they're not connected. I'd like to hear about the formula retail before we discuss the lease itself. I, I would not recommend um, requiring that to be held before that. The city has an obligation to respond to certain provisions in the lease in a timely matter. Well, we should have done it tonight. What Marianne, part, what part, I'm Paul, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Paul. What part of the formula retail ordinance are you uncertain about? I'm not uncertain about anything. I have a very firm understanding of it, but I want to make sure that the city's understanding is the same. And if it's not, I'd like to understand why. I believe that we all have the option of turning on the television and watching the next planning commission meeting and hearing the presentation. If I may. Which is one of what I'm going to do. Marianne? Um, I guess I'm confused what the nexus is between the lease for the shopping center and the formula retail, which is an operational, not a um, vendor contract. Is that the right terminology? It, it, so I guess I'm, I'm a little confused what the, the connection is between the two issues. Right, let me maybe help a little bit on that. I know, and I, I, ne I have yet to get a full analysis of what took place at the lumber yard between Washington Prime and James Pierce and all that. But I know at one point in time there was a some locations that James Pierce had at the lumber yard where there was a debate whether that in fact was consistent with our form of the retail ordinance and there was a plan to sort of bring that back to the Planning Commission to take a look at. And I think that had maybe what initially triggered the discussion at the Planning Commission. So I think that's what it was. I think there was a, an, uh, like one of the lo locations that James Pierce had there, there was a debate whether that in fact met with our formula retail or did not. Well, I understand that, but I think the item that's on closed session is a different issue. So I'm still confused what the connection is. I, I'm all for hearing the clarification and any corrections if the formula retail was applied incorrectly, but I don't understand what they have to do with the closed session item. Well, can we agree that we want to at least bring the, the, whatever the presentation the st or the staff was going to give the Planning Commission to the City Council so we can hear it before it goes to the Planning Commission? So I think we've got three votes to do that. Uh, is there a timing issue? Did, does Planning Commission, is it is it time sensitive? 
maybe? No, it is not time sensitive. Uh, this was to be a general overview. It's not related to a specific project. If you want to bring it here first, we can ask the planning commissioners to watch the city council meeting and we'll save you two doing the presentation twice then. Okay, well, what, whether there's a relationship or not, it sounds like we have a consensus to have it brought before us. Is that a correct? Well, let, let's make sure we're, we're clear about why we're doing this. Uh, I think Paul brought up a good question, and I appreciate the fact that uh, planning staff is responding to the planning commission. Uh, but I disagree with uh, uh, Councilmember Silverstein. This is not part and parcel to a closed session on a real estate transaction. Formula retail is formula retail. It's in its box and a real estate transactions in its box. And we have closed sessions to deal with uh, matters of negotiations and pricing and real estate matters. So I'm in favor of having the real estate issue, if there is one, in closed session. The form of the retail, that's, that's something we ought to review. And I think it's fine that we do that uh, uh, in a, a setting. I think it's better to do it in the uh, council setting than planning commission because we're going to hear it anyway. So let's kill two, let's kill two presentations with one. And uh, I think that would be better. I do suggest that we do have a, a handout of what those materials are before you, if it's going to be a slideshow or a deck or whatever, let's have that. And I, I'll make one comment about uh, James Pierce. I, I just want to say people need to realize the uh, genesis of how this came about. Uh, this James Pierce location fit every criteria for being a local business when he opened it up. He was, it was his second store inside 4,000 square feet. And he has managed over the last few years to go from that second store to being a retailer it's all across the United States and in several foreign countries. I kind of equate this to our homegrown, and he's a local resident too. This is not, not somebody from out of town. He lives here. And this is like our high school quarterback that now is playing in the Super Bowl. So let's, let's appreciate the fact the man's done a very good job, very successful, and um, let's honor him for being the home, homegrown kid that he is. So that said, uh, I suggest we do bring the form of the retail back. Let's bring it up to the council. Let's see what it says, see if we need to amend it. And uh, I think it's very simple to read, although there are things that need to be clarified on it. So if we can bring it back as a consensus. So Steve, can we make a... Get it on the agenda. We can do that. I think we got a consensus to do that. Okay. The, the next item okay. is I'm, I'm going to respond to the comment, a lot of the comments that were made, and I was going to speak about it myself as well. The um, the FPPC complaint. So on on Tuesday, October third, the F Fair Political Practices Commission, which we call the FPPC, informed Marianne Riggins, Paul Grisanti, Skylar Peak, Dennis Smith. Steve McClary and the city of Malibu that the enforcement division of the FPPC had received a sworn complaint against each and every one of them. It was filed, the sworn complaint was filed by Ann Ravel, who you've heard already is the former chair of both the FPPC and the Federal Elections Commission, as well as a former county counsel for Santa Clara County and deputy assistant attorney general for the U.S. Department, Justice Department. The FPPC letter states, at this time we have not made any determination about the allegations made in the complaint. Within 14 days, the complainant will be notified of our intent to, and then there are four options. Investigate the allegations of the complaint, refer the complaint to another government agency, take no action on the complaint because on the basis of the information provided, the commission does not appear to have jurisdiction to investigate, or take no action on the complaint because the allegations of the complaint do not warrant the Commission's further action. The FPPC's letter also invites comments from each of the people to whom it was addressed, people and entity, that will be considered in connection with the, FPP's, P, P, the FPPC's decision as to how to best proceed. I believe that it is imperative that we have a special meeting. I was going to actually make an emergency motion that we do something tonight, but since we have time to have a special meeting this week, I, I think it's imperative that we have a special meeting no later than this Thursday to consider what, if any, role the City Council should play in overseeing and directing the City's response, if any, to the sworn FPPC complaint. 
I intend to advocate at that special meeting that the city ask for additional time to respond to the FPPC so that the city council can formulate a response with the assistance of independent legal counsel. Now, I believe that, unfortunately, Marianne and Paul need to be recused and leave the room for the discussion on that matter, even on this very matter of whether to have a special meeting. Just as I was required to recuse myself and leave the room when Riva Feldman accused me of gender-biased activity, despite the fact that there was absolutely no evidence to support her claim that was ultimately determined after an extensive investigation to be baseless. Indeed, Riva did not even file a formal complaint, and yet I was recused from the city's involvement in the investigation, which was commissioned by the city council through a three-to-one vote after the three who voted to commission the investigation already had been advised by the city's legal counsel that the complaint lacked legal merit. Here, a sworn complaint has been lodged with the FPPC against two members of the city council. As such, I see no way they can lawfully participate in the city council's consideration of this very matter, especially when the very thing they are accused of is having a conflict of interest. Think of the irony of respondents to a formal complaint alleged, in a, alleged to have a conflict of interest participating in the city council's deliberations about the proper response to that complaint. If the FPPC has not already determined to institute a formal investigation, it materially enhances the probability that they will do so if the city council members accused of having a conflict are involved in the formulation of the city's response to the complaint. So I'm going to explain why I believe we need to have the special meeting, but I believe that two of our council members need to be recused from that conversation before I begin. And I'm going to ask that they do so. Trevor? Sure, I can, I can jump in here, and I would say that based on the evidence of what we've seen in the complaint, that I would not say that um, recusal is required for either council member in this case. No conduct from the council member has been alleged to be improper. The only allegations, factual allegations that have been contained therein are that they appointed the commissioners at issue. The commissioners at issue have their own obligation to comply with the FPPC regulations, that is their obligation, and serving alone on the Planning Commission does not constitute a violation of the FPPC, even if the theory put forward by Ms. Ravel was true and there was a requirement for these commissioners to recuse themselves from items where they could potentially, um, where there would be grading work or electrical work, there would still be plenty of other items that they would be able to participate in. So there is no basis put forward here for um, either council member, um, any allegations that, if, if true, would constitute a violation of the Political Reform Act. There's no financial interest from them involved. I do not see a reason that they would need to recuse themselves on this. So item. was I wrongfully advised that I needed to recuse myself when I was accused of something the city attorney had said had no legal merit? I did not provide that advice no, your in that case, but I believe it was based on allegations of conduct um, by you that would constitute, um, that would constitute, a, I don't remember what the... No, it was, it was based on allegations which, if true, 100% would not constitute a legal wrong, and we were so advised by the city attorney before I was told I needed to recuse myself. It was a meritless, legally meritless allegation. It may have been factually merit, meritorious. It was legally meritless. That was what the investigation concluded. That was what our attorney told us before it ever began. And I was told I needed to recuse myself so that these independent members of the city council could consider, without my input, whether, what the city's response to the allegation should be. Okay. Well, I, I can't speak to everything that occurred in that, in that case and what was privileged or was not, whether this was a, the nature of, of, of being involved in determining whether an investigation would be um, initiated or not. So all I can opine on is the facts that we have here before us. Okay, right so now. you're advising two members of city council who are charged in a sworn complaint with the FPPC that they can be involved in the conversation about what to do in response to it. I don't see that they're, they're charged, okay? There's no allegation they performed anything incorrect in this allegation. And the fact that just because someone charged would, would require them to be recused could lead to um, manipulation. Uh, someone could file a lawsuit or a complaint against only some members and not other members of the council manipulating who would be able to make a decision on there. So that's my advice. It's up to the council members if they want to recuse themselves or not.
I want to thank you, Bruce, for reminding us that it's election season coming soon, one year from now. And I want to thank you, Joe, and you, uh, gosh, who else is here still? Anyway, I, I think this is silly. So the way I'm seeing this FPPC uh, complaint and the investigation that's going to be done by the commission is one that's going to have far-reaching applications if it is determined to be factual that a licensed contractor cannot sit on a commission for the city that they live in. Um, I want to wait and see and hear what the commission has to say. I think it is important that we get a determination on this. Um, everything that I have read within the FPPC rules and guidelines is pretty clear that there isn't a violation here. But again, I'm just a layman. I'm not an attorney, so I probably am not reading the sentences the, the correct way, as many other esteemed people are. But I think that um, there's a process in the state. There is no wrongdoing. There are no cases whatsoever that either commissioner has benefited financially from their roles as a planning commissioner. Um, and I think it's appropriate that we let the process play out and see what the determination is by the FPPC once they complete their inquiry into this um, uh, document that has been filed with them. Okay, so I take that to be a non-recusal as well, that, which is all, the only question that was on the floor at this moment because I didn't cede the floor on the merits. So the, since we're going to all be talking about this, which I think is improper, I'll go ahead. The gist, this is, this is my advocacy for why we should have a consensus to have a special meeting no later than Thursday to discuss the city's response. And I believe that we, only three of us should be able to be involved in that, but if we're all five, so be it. The gist of Ms. Ravel's sworn complaint with the FPPC is that Schuyler and Dennis have inherent conflicts of interest when making land use decisions because such decisions provide a material opportunity for future personal profit, directly through the applicant, indirectly through relationships with development professionals representing the applicant, and also inherently through the creation of further development opportunities throughout Malibu, all to the detriment of the residents who depend upon the Planning Commission to faithfully apply the general plan, the vision statement, the mission statement to protect and preserve Malibu's fragile environment and rural nature. At our last regular meeting, Marianne and Paul downplayed and disparaged both Ms. Ravel and her complaint. At the last meeting of the Planning Commission, Schuyler and Dennis did the same thing, as did Jeff Jennings, who suggested, if not outright claimed, as did Paul again tonight, that it's a political stunt by me and or Steve. Unsurprisingly, our local hack blogger has also littered his personal airwaves and curated social media account with similar propaganda. For the record, Ms. Ravel informed the city manager and the interim city attorney of her concerns about the composition of the Planning Commission on August 16. I first learned of Ms. Ravel's letter more than a month later when I received a copy of the letter in an email from an acquaintance that said, quote, this letter from the former chair of the Fair Political Practices Commission and Federal Elections Commission to Trevor Rusin and Steve McClary has found its way into my inbox. I thought you should have this and know that it demands what it demands before it inevitably gets reported on. Before that time, I didn't know of Ms. Ravel. I had nothing to do with her letter, just, just as um, Jefferson said earlier. Didn't, didn't text with her, didn't FaceTime with her, didn't know who she was from Adam. The chronology of this matter is disturbing. Again, Ms. Ravel provided her letter to the city on or about August 16th. Actually, I've seen an email now that shows she sent it to the city on August 16th. I first learned of it from a member of the community who shared it with me more than a month later. Why was a copy of the letter not promptly provided to the city council? Was a copy provided to Marianne and Paul? If so, why were other members of the city council excluded from that process? What conversations, if any, has anyone from the city had with the people who were charged with um, a conflict in advance of, us, advance of the city council learning of this? 
The same thing occurred last week when the city received the letter from the FPPC informing the city that a sworn complaint had been filed against two city council members, two planning commissioners, and the city itself. I read about that complaint in the Malibu Times. I had to request a copy of the letter from the city, not once, not twice, but three times before I received it, even though two city council members already had a copy of the letter for some time before that, because they were copied on it, they were sent it by the FPPC. And they're the council members formally accused of violating the conflict of interest rules of the Political Reform Act. And our attorney can say the complaint doesn't state a claim against them. The fact is the FPPC says in its letter to the city they've been named as respondents in a sworn complaint. And the FPPC is going to decide what, if anything, to do with that. And the city is given an opportunity to respond. I was going to read from Ms. Ravel's letter, but I, I, I will not. I encourage everyone who hasn't seen the letter to get a copy of it and read it. It's a well-crafted letter by an experienced lawyer, not only an experienced lawyer, an experienced person who has much more experience in these matters than any of us do. Now, for my part, I lack firsthand knowledge of any project-specific or applicant-specific conflict by Schuyler Peak or Dennis Smith, but I do believe they suffer from a general disqualifying conflict of interest respecting all land use or development matters that come before the Planning Commission on account of the fact that their livelihood depends upon working on development matters in Malibu and or with, for, and or on the recommendation of individuals and companies that regularly appear before the Planning Commission and or perform material work for applicants who do so, some of whom are sitting right here in the front row today. This inherent conflict exists without regard to whether Schuyler or Dennis has actually received a single piece of work in that manner and without regard to the best of their intentions, which I credit them with. I believe they have the best of intentions. It also seems to me, however, that Schuyler and Dennis would be well advised to stop talking about the issue. After watching the most recent Planning Commission meeting, I was struck by the ignorance of the statements that they made. People who are named as respondents in a sworn complaint with the FPPC should not be talking about the complaint. The same thing applies to comments by Paul and Marianne at our last city council meeting and again tonight. I'll tell you, like Donald Trump, they all continue to develop a record for the proponent of any investigation or prosecution. We hear on the news repeatedly, and it's good, good advice, don't speak publicly when you're named as a defendant. At the last meeting of the Planning Commission, Jeff Jennings stated he was disturbed by Ms. Ravel's failure to identify the client for whom she was working. Although Jeff intended his remarks to reflect poorly on Ms. Ravel, the only person upon whom the remarks reflect poorly is Jeff, who apparently fails to appreciate that lawyers often perform pro se, pro bono legal work for the public good. When I read Ms. Ravel's letter, I assumed she was raising serious issues in her capacity as a public watchdog, a role for which she has a sterling reputation. I spoke with Ms. Ravel this weekend. She confirmed to me that she is indeed pursuing this matter on her own and not on behalf of any undisclosed client. In essence, a sophisticated and experienced public watchdog has identified what she views to be a troubling situation in Malibu and has taken it upon herself to try to help right the ship because the powers that be within the city refuse to do so on their own. It's offensive that Jeff Jennings would denigrate Ms. Ravel for failing to disclose her client when one does not exist. Jeff also branded Ms. Ravel's letter a political stunt as we approach an election year, something we just heard again from Paul. Again, no such thing has occurred. I suppose, however, that Jeff had that knee-jerk reaction because he and folks with whom he's aligned have historically participated in the same type of political dirty tricks he assumes to be practiced by others. In psychological terms, that's called projection. In any event, aside from his commentary being in bad taste, I believe Jeff Jennings would be wise also to keep his views to himself going forward, as it would not surprise me in the least if he were added to any investigation that may ensue based on his personal and professional relationship with Doug Burge, whose projects regularly appear before the Planning Commission and are often approved by a vote of three to two, with Jeff being one of the three and Dennis and or Schuyler sometimes being also one or two of the three. Paul would also be well advised to stop publicly proclaiming that this is that his firsthand knowledge of the individual council, this is a quote from his, from his website, he has firsthand knowledge of the individual council persons, the general plan, IZO, and the city staff, which have proven to be of great value to his clientele and coworkers. 
That's a written statement that appears in multiple places on the Internet where Paul advertises his professional services. It screams of a conflict of interest, and it reflects very poorly on Malibu in general and Paul in particular. Thank I suspect, you, Bruce. May I you respond? Will, you, we, you can, you'll have your turn to say as much as you want whenever you want. I'm almost Council members, this is also not I an item on the agenda. I suspect that various public well, – no, I'm asking for a consensus that we have a yes. special meeting by Thursday, and I'm explaining why. I suspect that various public and private statements by Marianne are likely to be scrutinized if this matter comes forward as well. I know for certain that there are some that will. Because Paul, Steve, and I are the only members of the City Council who are not implicated by Ms. Ravel's sworn complaint, it's necessary and appropriate that these other two Council members recuse themselves even though they refuse to do so. But in any event, I ask that we have a consensus to bring this back at a special meeting, not a special closed session meeting, a special meeting to decide whether the City Council and not the City's attorney and the City Manager on their own should be responsible for deciding what position, if any, the city should take in response to the sworn complaint. And Paul, with that, you can say as much as a little, as much as you'd like. And I have other comments on other issues. I, ju I just want to take a minute and talk about the the uh, website that he refers to, which is apparently something from the Cold War banker days that still exists somewhere. And what? people hire me for is my education. And they hire me because they don't want to waste a lot of time trying to do something that every, that this is in the past 40 years, something that was never going to get approved by the Coastal Commission or the county or the city. And that is, it saves time for everybody concerned. And I believe that Bruce has said in the past that our staff should tell people no if they bring them something that isn't going to work. Well, the realtors also do that. They, they tell people who bring them stupid projects that those are stupid projects, and it really doesn't make sense for them to waste their time on something that's never going to work, and they'd be much happier if they bought something that was already suitable for their uses. I actually... I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Thanks. Well, no, I'm, I'm finished with this request. I have comments on other matters altogether, but I'd like to know if we could have a consensus to have a special meeting by Thursday to decide what position, if any, the city should take in response to the FPPC letter re that invites response. You know, my take is, look, we've got a responsibility to the residents here to look like we are ethical and transparent. Uh, and I think that means that they deserve to see how we're going to – I think this is a serious complaint, and I think it deserves a serious answer from the city. So I'd like to see us bring it back, and let's figure out what the hell we want to do with it versus just ignoring it, which is what we're doing now. <coughs> Okay, I said this last time, I'll say it again. This is something that needs to be reviewed in private uh, closed session, and Bruce could not have made a better case for that than the fact that Mary Ann and uh, Paul, as he says, shouldn't be making public statements. How else can they talk in a public session uh, and not violate the, the guidelines he just outlined for them? And on top of that, look, we've got... This is the beginning of a silly season. And unfortunately, we're watching the politicalization of the city council start to reoccur, and it's unnecessary. We've had a good nine, ten months of working closely together, and I'm looking in my notes for what I want to talk about tonight. AYSO, baseball fields, uh, the triathlon, the money that was donated to Children's Hospital. And we're talking about something from one person. And I'm going to I'm going to take the floor from Bruce for a minute. Uh, by the way, thanks to the triathlon for giving money to the Boys and Girls Club, million dollars plus to the Children's Hospital. Great job. You guys did it on short notice. Yeah, glad you did it. The Sheriff's Department, everybody else that made it work. Came off reasonably well. Now, as far as AYS goes um, and the baseball, park, baseball fields and pools, Alicia couldn't have, hit the, couldn't have hit the nail better on the head. 
we've got a project underway, and the city manager just mentioned it as one of our priorities that just came out of the planning operation to start figuring out what we're going to do with our vacant land. We are not going to have a pool or a new baseball field or a new, softball, or a new uh, soccer field next month. It's going to take years. We have the money for it, but just as you've seen with the skate park, it takes time to get things done. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Ms. Ravel, some people, some people said, oh, she's a professor at uh, UC Berkeley Law School. Uh, she's this, she's that. Okay, she's a, a lecturer. I looked her up at UC Berkeley. I used to be a lecturer at UCLA for business. You're a part-time employee. What she is, is a lawyer with the law firm of McDanis and Faulkner in San Jose. When you read her letter, it does, and this is, and I know I'm going to get criticized for this. And by the way, I'm the only person up here that isn't named in the cotton picking complaint. Witness, witness, uh, respondent, 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 respondent. I don't know what I've done not to be on the, on the list of Mr. Bell, but I'm sure my time will come. Now, if you read her letter, it starts off without the usual first paragraph of every letter I've ever gotten from an attorney. My name is Joe or Jane Doe, and I represent fill in the blank. It doesn't say that. It's obviously missing. What's also missing in, this, in her letter, not once in there does she use the word, I assert, I see, I anything. This is just a, a letter that could have started off with, I represent X, Y, Z, and here's all the facts that go with it. It begs the question who her client is. Now, Bruce has made the comment that she's doing it pro bono. I don't know that her law firm really wants her to be a pro bono attorney who spent all the time to develop all the facts that are in that letter. Somebody had to feed it to her. Somebody's her client. And I'm not saying anybody's doing anything wrong, but there almost ought to be a disclosure presentation up here about who knows what about who, who's worked on this, who's fed information, who's paid for this. So look, let's still get the card before the horse. We got one person who says the FP, I'll never get this right, FPPC, for the first time in 50 years since they put their uh, standards of conflict of interest in place, suddenly has come up with this novel idea that if you're a contractor, you can't do uh, planning commission work in a city the size or the area the size of Malibu and the associated Southern California market. Now, I'm going to carry that a step further. And this is why I think this is almost silly business. If you're an insurance agent and you're on a planning commission and you write the insurance policy down the line for uh, a project, even after you left the commission, aren't you doing the same thing as the contractor? How about the banker that makes a construction loan, takes out the permit loan? Or how about a lawyer that's sitting on the city council that is able to make decisions today and, pra and who practices law in Malibu has a California license? And I'm talking about Bruce. Everybody that works in a profession has the same baggage that this is talking about. We all fill out the same, every planning commissioner, every elected official, even some of the employees in the city staff have to fill out the conflict of interest forms that the FPPC requires. We do it all the time. This is where my money is. This is where I've invested in. These are my clients. All that information is public, and you got to fill it out all the time. So look, this is a very novel approach by one woman who probably is being, who is representing people that may be in this room or watching this on, on television, and maybe even some of the people up here on the podium. I don't know. But here's the point we want to make. We have a legal issue right now. And if I was in my business suit, as opposed to my elected official suit, I'd say, look, let's get our legal counsel together, BBK, and have them produce a response so that we can reply to their request for information. We haven't been sued yet. Nobody's got a complaint against them. It's an inquiry. Let's keep it at, at the appropriate level of response. And when it's time, then we can carry it out in more public setting. Right now, we've got one person who's made an allegation. Now, granted, she's got a history and a resume, but she's a paid lawyer, and she's got a client, and she's advocating for the client. It's no different than our uh, 
people that come before us on real estate transactions that are expediters. So let's keep this in the right process. And by the way, anybody that says BB and K is conflicted on this needs to read the footnotes on Mr. Bell's letter. They're quoted several times as being the experts on conflicts of interest. I believe it's uh, footnote number 46 and there's another one in there. And actually quotes your pamphlet that is handed out to every person here that gets an uh, elected official job. Come on, folks. Let's keep this perspective and let's not try and put a bunch of spin on it until we see what the issues are. I wouldn't be surprised if the FPPC says, thank you very much. There's nothing to see here. We appreciate your time and interest. And it goes away. We have, we have 14 days to respond. If we're going to have a hearing on it, let's keep everybody's sanity on this. Do it in closed session. They can see the letter after we write it. And then we'll see what the FPPC says. Right now, every person up here except me is on the list. And I'm sure by tomorrow morning I'll be on it too. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm asking for a special meeting. I don't believe, based on conversations with Trevor, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, that we're permitted to have a closed session. I'm fine with the motion being to have it in closed session, which it sounds like three of us agree should occur, but I don't know that we can have a closed session meeting, so I'd, I'd like to get clarification on that. We could have a discussion in closed session on the aspects of it um, pertaining to potential litigation. Okay. Then the mo then the request is that we have consensus to have a special meeting by Thursday, closed session, to discuss what response, if any, the city should take. Now, I want to respond some to respond to some of the responses. Um, again, I I I don't believe Doug is saying that he thinks I'm being untruthful, but maybe if he wants to say so, he can. I have had nothing to do with this letter or the filing of the complaint. I suspect Steve Uring is prepared to say the same thing. Norm Haney was added today, I understand, as a witness. The fact that I was named as a witness, I don't know why, but I suspect it's because I, like everyone else, including Doug, have witnessed what happens in the city of Malibu while sitting here on the city council. Uh, now. I filed two appeals to the Coastal Commission, one of which is pending, and I understand they're, they're going to find there's a substantial issue, and they're working on a remediation plan based on the complaint I filed. I, I filed a very lengthy complaint. I filed a brief in support of it. I spent a lot of time doing it. I didn't represent a client. It doesn't start off by saying my name is Bruce Silverstein. I'm an attorney in Malibu, and I represent so-and-so because I don't represent a client. I represent myself. I don't even represent myself. I am the complainant and I filed a very serious complaint because I saw a very serious problem. That's what I understand Ms. Ravel has done. It's not the first time that she's done it. She's not, whether she's a professor at Berkeley or a lecturer at Berkeley, which I didn't say she was at all, by the way, she is the former chair of the FPPC. She is the former chair of the Federal Elections Commission. She is a former assistant U.S. Attorney General with the Justice Department. She is the former county counsel for Santa Clara County. So it's easy to pick up the fact that she's not a professor at Berkeley, which wasn't even identified as one of her credentials, and criticize it. That's called a straw man. We're being told, repeated, we, we've, been, we've been counseled and we've been, it's been argued by, by Paul and Marianne, we should not prejudge the facts. I agree. We should not prejudge the facts. That means not prejudging that there's a problem and not prejudging that there's not a problem. And that is why I believe the city council needs to take a look at this and take charge of the city's response to this. And I'll say, if the city doesn't respond to it in a way the city council directs, I'm going to respond to it. Thanks, Bruce. Just, and I'm, I'll get to my turn when it comes around, but I can tell you right now, I have never spoken to this Ann Ravel. Never spoken to her. I've never contributed any money to anybody who has anything to do with Ann Ravel. So, and how I get to be a witness, maybe it's because of the chair I'm sitting in. Who knows? Uh, so just to be clear, uh, she may have a client someplace. I'm not aware of that. Okay. And, uh, well, we haven't heard from Marianne, but it sounds like three people want to have a special I think, I think closed session meeting at least. Any objection to having a closed session meeting to discuss this? Paul, anybody? Marianne? 
None whatsoever. Marianne? I have none, but I'm only available remotely. Okay. Can we schedule a closed session meeting? Let's do that. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we'll pull council members and try to make it for availability no later than this Thursday. Cool. Thank you very much. Bruce, anything else? Yeah, I do have some other comments, but you know what? I, I've, I've spoken well more than enough, so um, I'll make them next week if they're still appropriate. Doug? There's no oxygen left in the room. I'm going to yeah. pass. Okay. <laughs> Paul? I just want to say that I, I enjoyed a very nice conversation during the last two weeks with Lindsay Horvath about her her application to uh, the feet to uh, NOAA for the uh, and our support for the grant that she's applying for to remediate several beaches in Los Angeles County and spending half of the, the money here in Malibu if it happens. And uh, very encouraging to talk to her and tell her of our support. And I can't give her credit often enough because she is the one who pushed that forward. Uh, at the COG meeting we had, we attended last week, we talked about zero bail. I'm sure that's going to come back as an agendized item. And uh, I also attended the business roundtable for part of the meeting. And that's about it. Thank you. Marianne? I wanted to um, thank the speakers with regards to the field space and, um, you know, to John and Jake and others from the Malibu Little League, to Scott, uh, it, was it Amor? Am I pronouncing Amor. it right? And Paul from Malibu AYSO. Um, both of those programs have been longstanding partners in this community and they've done a lot of great work and I'm... Um, very happy to see their program. Um, if there are others out there that are starting new programs, whether it be in the pool, whether it be a field sport, something else, I encourage you to talk early, early, early in your planning of development of any things. Talk to our staff members, find out what the rules and requirements are, find out the facts about equipment and everything else, and make sure that you have everything planned out uh, before you start. Our staff is great and they'll work with you and try and find solutions for any programs, but um, at least three months in advance before you're planning on starting anything. That would be incredibly helpful. Um, I think we can learn a lot of grace and thanks to Alicia Peak, um, Parks and Rec Commissioner. Uh, she's coming to it with um, an open mind and an open heart and that can only bring benefit to our community. Uh, again, thank you to Assembly Member Irwin and her team um, and the city staff team and the help in Sacramento to get AB 1500 passed. I think that'll be really helpful to our uh, Wilsey Fire victims um, to make sure that they have the time uh, to get on their feet and hopefully get their homes rebuilt. Uh, I attended a, the environmental sustainability meeting and we reviewed the dark skies. Um, staff is working very hard to implement our dark skies in our commercial facilities. Our gas stations um, have been their primary focus right now, but that will be rolling out to the residents, and I encourage everybody to learn about the dark skies program. Look at your, feature, your fixtures that are already at the house, um, and um, you know, talk to your homeowners association and other things. This is a great program for our community. It will allow our residents to be able to see the stars again. Um, we have so many impacts from the developed communities around us. At least if we do our part within our city, um, we'll be able to see the nighttime skies and see the, the Milky Way again, which um, I'm lucky from my vantage point where my house is, I get to see it uh, most nights unless the fog's there. Um, I wanted to mention that the ERB will be hearing the permanent skate park um, proposal this week on Wednesday, look at our website for the information with regards to that meeting. The permanent skate park is an incredibly important development for Bluffs Park and for our community. We've been, um, the skaters have been dealing with the, the temporary skate park for much longer than it was ever envisioned to be there. And it's important that the permanent skate park moves forward as quickly as possible and that that get built so that our 
um, skaters in our community um, all have access to that and are able to take part in a great new facility. Um, and I look forward, I'm very excited to hear about the public participation uh, with regards to our vacant land. I'm looking forward to getting the public involved in that and seeing what we can do with the vacant land. You know, we closed escrow on those properties September of 2018. Two months later, the Woolsey fire happened and we haven't been able to move forward on that. And they were acquired with the understanding of how deficient our community has been since the formation. It's mentioned in our general plan that we do not have enough facilities for recreation. And so our community needs to come together um, so that we have those facilities built. I know how important they are to the community. So uh, please take part in any surveys that you hear from those and let your voices be heard and let's get some things built for our community. Uh, we have the land, it's time for us to do something with it. And um, for the, the gentleman having issues with his, his view protection um, with the trees and the vegetation, um, it sounds like he's participating in things, I'm guessing from the pictures of his homies in Malibu Country Estates, and I think they might have some special rules there too. So I just uh, encourage him to continue to work with staff and um, work with the process that's in place in order to try and get uh, restoration of his view issues. And that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Okay, I'm gonna try and be reasonably short here. Uh, to the speakers, thank you all very, very much. I think, you know, you, you did a good job. Uh, the AYS zone, Lily folks, I encourage you to talk to Kristen. I mean, she has, she knows what she's doing and she can help you get some of this stuff done. Uh, so I, I encourage you to make sure you inc incorporate her in your discussions. And so we're all headed in the same direction. Howard Retzke, I understand, and, and I, we don't disagree that the staff is overworked in terms of some of the stuff. So that's why at the last meeting, we tried to limit the number of projects we were gonna work on to I think it was 20, right? Uh, to try and give up the staff a chance to get the stuff done without you know, having to work weekends and nights and everything to do that. So we heard you, and we, if, I, I don't know what you were doing when you weren't listening to that meeting, because that's exactly what we were doing during the course of that meeting. Uh, I mentioned I don't know Ann Repel, but let me just, let me, okay, I'm, I'm probably not going to make any friends with this one either. Uh, ethics and transparency have been a topic that I have been aware of for some time now. You know, during my time on the Planning Commission and now on the City Council, I've had ongoing conversations with a significant number of residents who believe that the city is not playing by the Marcus at Queenberry rules when it comes to treating everyone equally. Their concern is that when we're pushed, the city makes decisions that favor development and the rich and famous. And the problem is there are numerous instances where the city's actions serve to support that concern. Not to go back too far, the Whole Foods Shopping Center development was approved based upon a city traffic study that concluded the traffic in Malibu had not increased in the last 25 years. Done by people who never drive, I guess. When the design of the shopping center could not provide the code required for open space, the city said if they take your 12-foot walls and cover them with 22,000 square feet of green foliage, the city will count those 12 foot walls as open space. Now, I was on the planning commission for a number of years. I never had a homeowner come in and say, I want to put more open space and let me put some walls up uh, and, and accomplish it through that manner. So yeah, just that's a story there. Now, the concerns with an unlevel playing field have increased in the last couple of months. You have the recent $10,000 pay for play wedding event that took place on Broad Beach. We have the situation at the Malibu Lumber Yard where it appears that James Purse is using his influence to move, move local Malibu businesses out of the Lumber Yard to provide additional space for themselves. Or you can turn to the Kardashian fiasco where it appears that there'll be a lot of money in play and very little city oversight. Now when ethics and transparency are missing in municipal government, it leads to a wide range of problems and negative consequences. One of the most significant problems is the perception of corruption which can manifest itself in a variety of forms. Corruption, real or perceived, is followed up with an erosion of public trust. And transparency is essential for building and maintaining trust between the government and our citizens. When the public perceives decisions are made behind closed doors or that officials are engaged in unethical behavior, 
trust in the government erodes, and that's not good. That, in turn, leads to a decrease in civil engagement. When citizens perceive that their voices are not being heard and that decisions are made without their input, they become disengaged from the political process, which begins to erode the foundation of our community. And that brings me to the FPPC complaint. I believe it is important for the city to cooperate with the FPPC. If the planning commissioners should be removed, let's remove them and send a positive message to the residents that we have the ethics and the transparency to do the right thing. If there is no problem, we can send that message to the residents also that says, in fact, we were doing the right thing. But to sit here and do nothing, which is what we've done since August 16th, whenever the hell that letter came in, I just think is the wrong, wrong thing. And I think I, I, I think I mentioned this last week. Kelsey keeps sending me ethics courses I have to keep taking. Uh, and, and the ethics courses, they repeat over and over again. Perception is a problem, right? Perception is, is, is it bad, you know? It, it's anything else. So I think what we've got a situation here is the perception of what we're doing may not be good for the message we're sending to our residents. I hope we can get this closed session in place and do the right thing. So thank you very much with that. I'll move to the consent, unless somebody else has something to say. Anybody? Going to the consent calendar. I'm just calendar. waiting to second you on the consent calendar. Let's do the consent calendar. All right. Anybody want to pull anything on consent, Kelsey? We don't have any uh, in-person speaker slips, but I do believe we have some raised hands from the public. Parker? No, there's no raised hands. Okay. Then no, no one likes to pull anything. Uh, anybody in the council want to prove some, pull something? I think we've pulled one item already, right? 3B4. That's 3B4, correct. right. Anybody else want to pull anything? Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? Move that we... I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. I'll oh. third it. Kelsey? Councilmember Silverstein? It, it was, it was Councilmember Riggins' okay. motion. Sorry, Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Now, I want to take a, a break at some point, but before they do that, Rob DeBow, we have had him sitting in our meetings you know, he's probably tired of seeing us at midnight. So, Rob, I'd like to bring up item 6A and see if we can't get that resolved. And maybe after that, we can take a quick break. Do I have any problem? I think we started to do that. That was, we changed yeah. the agenda. Give us, come on, Rob, give us a staff report. So good evening, Mayor and Council, and glad to be out here after three weeks of trying to get this, but no, I appreciate um, giving the opportunity to kind of give you an update on the outdoor warning siren system. Uh, tonight, yeah, I'll, I'll give an update. I have a, um, a few alternatives, and then I want to get some input from Council on see what we want to do next. So. Uh, So, first, a little background on the outdoor sirens. 2018, uh, the president declared the Woosley Fire a natural disaster. So, what that what that resulted in is the federal government giving certain funds available to the city to use for certain projects like rebuilding the city um, and doing other grant projects. Um, city applied for and received a grant from FEMA. Um, it was a FEMA hazard, hazard mitigation grant to design a outdoor warning system. In 2020, the city conducted a sound study showing uh, locations of potential outdoor siren locations. Um, the goal was to see how these sirens can work within our environment, our canyons, um, see if, if it's possible to have the siren sounds go through everyone's home and it, people can hear it. Um, the sound study was brought to the Public Safety Commission where they provided their input. And then later back in November of 2020, City Council uh, um, directed staff to move forward with the design of an outdoor warning system. 
And in 2021, the city issued an RFP for a design consultant to actually do design of the outdoor warning system. So this next slide is a slide showing the available funding for this project. The design service was just under 200,000. The pilot phase, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is around 30,000. The construction of the sirens, outdoor sirens, is 32, that being proposed, is 2.5 million. And you can see the total is $2.7 million. Funding from FEMA, which is the hazard mitigation grant that I mentioned, it was 951,000. And if we did all those items that we've mentioned above, we would need additional funding of almost 1.8 million. So let me talk a little about the outdoor sirens. Um, in, in November of 21, um, the city issued a contract with acoustic technology for design of the outdoor sirens, and they performed a preliminary design for the city. But the preliminary design um, concluded that the city would need to put up uh, the, the siren poles, the 50 foot siren poles, a total of 32 sirens within the city, and the estimated cost for the sirens was 2.5 million. Um, an outdoor warning siren steering committee was actually formed and, and recommended by city council, and they were um, they were part of the process of actual design of the of the outdoor siren system. They provided input um, to to the design consultant and staff along the way. Um, after that, uh, the public safety commission. Uh, review the preliminary design and came up with some alternatives, which I'll be talking about now. So here are the four alternatives that I'll be talking about tonight. The first one is the pilot phase. Second one is the permanent installation of the sirens. The third alternative is a phased siren um, installation. And the fourth alternative is an indoor notification system. So here's alternative one, it's a pilot phase. Uh, these are temporary uh, um, sirens that are located or they're on trailer mounted um, systems. The poles are 30 foot tall, there's four speakers and the system will be deployed at eight locations throughout the city. And most specifically, they'll be put out to where uh, during, during events of like Santa Ana's where we have high winds, so we can get some really good input on, on the functionality and how these, how these sirens work out in the field. Um, the system would require a TUP for this, and as I mentioned, this phase would cost uh, $30,000 to do it. This slide is showing the location of the eight um, uh, locations for the, the pilot phase. Alternative two is the permanent installation. And, and so this includes uh, installing 32 poles or throughout the city. The poles will be between 30 and 50 foot tall. Um, the, the systems will have a battery backup system that will provide power to these the sirens if power wants out. Uh, the system requires communication to communicate from the central controller to each of the sirens. That's typically a cell tower or a cell connection. There can be other connections that has uh, um, internet connections to the signals, but that's how that signal the central central computerized system sends alert out to those sirens. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the sirens are designed for to alert the public outdoors, but not specifically indoors. Our, the sound study had, had indicated that there were some issues potentially with the sirens um, reaching out into inside the people's or, or the residents' homes during, during an event. Um, the sirens do require a CDP for each, each of the locations, so that would be 32 separate C CDPs, and would require at least uh, $1.8 million in additional funding to do this phase. Here's a mock-up of the potential locations, a few locations of what the sirens would look at. 
Here's a map showing the 32 locations without, within the city. Alternative three. Alternative three is just a phased approach of, install, of permanent installation. Uh, the, the sirens will just be the same as, as alternative number two, which is the permanent installation, but only going to be placed in those high-risk areas. This too requires CDP, and depending upon the number of sirens that are installed, may require additional funding. The last one is an indoor warning system. These are designed to provide the community with warnings inside their home and to uh, provide that system. Be, they, that, it can also be put in other, other buildings, like as uh, shopping centers, stores. Uh, the alerts can be, can be national weather warnings, amber alerts, school closings, evacuations, uh, California earthquake early warning alerts. Uh, these are small receiver type of devices that are placed in the home, but they're also portable enough to where somebody can bring them and bring them in their car and take them with them. The power to these systems are you can plug them in at your house and have continuous power uh, to that unit, but they also have AA batteries that provide um, a four week battery backup system to the unit. Um, the, the system uses FM radio uh, frequencies to broadcast that signal. So the uh, communication issues that you would have with other, with other, um, with the outdoor warning sirens may not be applicable here because the FM signal is not relying on some of those items with that. Um, in this in the slide, you can see down here. There's Alert FM. That's one of the vendors that supplies this system. Um, if this is an alternative that the city would look into. We would go and put together an RFP out for this type of system to see if we can get different vendors to um, for the system. Um, last couple things is that uh, we we searched around and we discovered that Butte County and Shasta County do have uh, this system up in play, and they have mentioned that great success on getting their alerts out to the public and especially to the community where it's really needed. Um, lastly, uh, we, we did a little backup information on this and we, we discovered that, that the, there's a, there's a $400,000 initial cost for the system and about $25,000 annual cost. Um, and each unit is a hundred dollars. Um, lastly, um, uh, May 20, May uh, of this last year, the Public Works Commission and the Public Safety Commission held a joint meeting and they recommended going with the pilot program, but also um, felt that the indoor notification system was a good alternative too. So before I turn it over to council, I, I wanted to give my thoughts since this is a project we've been working on for, for, for a couple years now. And, and um, I, I have some pros and cons on both of the systems and, and I'd like to give that information to you guys right now. First one is outdoor warning sirens. They are uh, um, designed for outdoors, and, and it's great for um, alerting, getting that alert out to people who are outside, not necessarily people who are inside. Our city has very challenges with canyons and different wind events and kind of a thing, and people with, with double pane windows, this may be a challenge to actually get that alert system to those people inside the house. Um, I mentioned too earlier that it requires communication to activate, such as a cellular system or some type of internet or some type of system. When power goes out, that may be troublesome or maybe a, a problem of trying to get that signal out to the, to the alert system. Um, as I mentioned too, this is a quite expensive project and we require additional funding. And, and but most importantly, um, this option requires installation of 32 poles, 30 feet, 50 feet tall within the city. And, and if you think about that, and um, that really doesn't go with the city's uh, mission statement. And, and that's kind of my concern about the about the outdoor sirens. Looking into the indoor sirens, you look at 
the target audience on, on really who it's who it's going towards, and that's really the community, the people that are living inside the homes and need that alert when they're in the, in their homes. Usually, when you have these events where there's fire events or something, people are inside their homes, and this is a good way of getting that message out to them. Uh, um, there's other devices with um, up this up with this um, indoor nor notification system that actually shakes beds and, and does that and wakes people up. So you can kind of wake up and hear hear the alarm, hear what's going on, and kind of doing that. Um, so so with that, this is my recommendation would be to to investigate farther into the indoor notification system. Uh, uh, we made initial conversation with FEMA with our grant consultant to see and if this funding for this type of system would be covered. Uh, we, we would have to require some paperwork to kind of see what that request is, but um, we can make that process happen and then try to get this uh, system up and running. But with that, um, I turn it over to council and, I, and I'm available for questions. Rob, thank you very, very much. Any questions for Rob before we go to public comment? Oh, questions or questions? Do my comments after public comment. Here so since we've had all this discussion about FPPC requirements, um, since this is citywide, um, one of these locations is proposed near my residence. Do I need to step aside or disclose that, or what's the direction? Are these particular locations set, Rob, or are the or we, we're just looking at the citywide systems at this place, right? The uh, locations have been recommended. Those final locations can be adjusted um, during the final design. This was a preliminary design showing the locations of, of those poles. And so it's not final, final, but it can be, it's, it's preliminary at this point. At this point, you're just looking for direction on which of these options to select, is that correct? Correct. And the, so the, the final project's not there, and um, when that would come forward, we want to look at it. There may be more than one of you that is close to it. It also could be a situation where the public generally could, um, exception could apply due to how many people it would, it would be close to. Okay. And then um, is the, the, the thought that this uh, warning would be projected into the neighborhood, I guess I'm, or is this where for the fires or, because it would just seem that if this is regarding fires, being up in the hills, but this is just for the general neighborhood notifications and general public gathering spots? Are, are you referring to the outdoor warning sirens? Uh, yes, general? I'm sorry, yes. So there's a number of options and alert systems and notifications that can be done with the outdoor warning sirens. You have evacuation, you can have a tsunami, you can have a number of different alert systems that can be done. It, it can be an alert, it can be a voice, it can be, it can be a number of things. And so it's not just for a fire or an alert. Okay, I guess where my question is that they seem to be, um, you know, located along the coastline where most of our fires come from outside the city limits, not the ocean. Um, so just trying to understand the location spots and what the um, the benefit of those particular places are. So as I mentioned, we did a sound st uh, study showing locations, what's the optimal locations for all the sirens for the entire city to hear an outdoor warning siren. So those locations were based on this a sound study and sound analysis throughout the city. So that's, there's there's no, it's more along the coast or not. It's just based on the analysis and the, the engineering that, will, that went along with that. That was what was recommended. Okay. I, I just, I see a, a large spot, um, Latigo and Corral, is, doesn't have any coverage whatsoever. So on the proposed pilot locations... On the beach. Oh, for the pi <laughs> for the pilot locations, those were just locations that the Public Safety Commission actually selected, knowing that those would be just a pilot program just to kind of see how this goes. What we the idea was to try to get a 
good representation for various neighborhoods for this pilot program, but not necessarily. This isn't the eight locations you sh you're seeing on there for the pilot locations isn't the it isn't the map that's needed to show where the sound system's going everywhere. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I've got one. Paul, uh, the uh, it seems I, I think the pilot phase is something I'd really like to do. I don't know if they actually tested any sirens, but I think for all of us to get a, a feel at over this is talking about testing over a two week period and the cost is fairly moderate. So I think that that's a good idea to let people hear them and let them see if they like them. And I am also very fond of the uh, indoor notification systems if you happen to be living in an area where there is FM coverage. Uh, if there was a system based on AM radio, I would be more confident because I actually live in a place where I can get AM radio. I can't get FM where I am. But then the sirens would be really useful for me. And, and when I look at the 32 locations that were chosen, that were the design study came up with, I think that we're all probably within 500 feet of one of those. How's that question going so far? Uh, oh, wait, there wasn't a question, was there? I apologize. Okay, uh, public speakers, uh, anybody, any additional questions going out? No, okay, we got two public speakers. John, you're first, followed by Joe. Uh, and John, you got three minutes. We're gonna, now you got three. We're, got it, it, yeah, yeah, too late, three minutes. Too late? Yeah. Turned in before you called yeah, in. I did, didn't you? No, no. Okay, cut me down. Okay, I I attended the first public safety commission. It was a four-one vote against the system because the consultant said you cannot hear them in a Santa Ana. Period. Okay, the sound travels with the air. Eight of only eight of these thirty-two are off the, off the ocean. Eight. All the rest are right on the beach. So Marianne, you can tell the seals that used to be out front of you that there's a fire coming. Okay, now the second thing is, how often do you go stand out in a Santa Ana and wait to hear a siren? Never. Nobody goes to the beach in a Santa Ana. It's not fun. So you have to consider that this is not planning by grant. It's just because you get free money, you don't waste it. And this is totally wasted. I. I have a house in Oahu, I'm 400 feet from a siren. Every time it goes off, people don't even look around. Okay, is it a tsunami? They never have tsunamis, okay? It's, it becomes a test. And you must realize that this is not two, two million or whatever he said. You gotta maintain this system year after year after year and test it and test it and test it. You also have to have the Planning Commission have 32 hearings, okay? 32 hearings. It's crazy just to put up polls that, are, that won't work in, in, the, uh, in the wind. And so you need an indoor system. I got a free one from the city. Every time there's some weird thing going on in LA, this thing goes off and it wakes me up and something's happening and a fire in Palos Verdes or something, or earthquake in Fresno, uh, but it works. And it was free. I don't know where the $100 comes in, but the city gave me one. Um, so you have to look at the practicality of this. They, the, the consultant said they didn't work. He said they, you can put them up in, up in the hills and it will come down, and you might hear it outside. You will not hear it inside. So we put them all on the beach so the whales can hear them, okay? Eight of them up in the hills. and. Uh, Paul, you're not going to hear it. It's, it's in the county if you're going to hear it. Now, you all know when we have fires, they start in the valley or that direction. People see smoke. Everybody calls everybody. The wind's blowing. You know it. Uh, and in 30 seconds, I just want to say, remember Maui. They didn't turn them on because you had people up the hill if they think there's a tsunami. So you didn't turn them on. So you didn't kill a bunch of people heading into the fire. Uh, these are not for here. 
they don't work here, you can send every one of you guys to Hawaii and save the money on testing them. Go to Hawaii, find out when they're going to turn them on, and go listen. It's cheaper. It's $192 round trip. Thank you. Thanks, John. <laughs> go. Um, I agree with John, and I was in the public works meeting, and we didn't have as much information on the alert FM system as we have now, and I do have one of those crazy radios in my house, but apparently I was talking to Hans Letts, and he said that there are directional antennas you can put in your area, like there could be one in Big Rock, there could be one where you live, Paul, to get the FM power to these indoor alert systems. So I think that's probably, and it's much, I think the whole, the grant will cover that whole thing. So I think that's the one that you guys should go with. The, apparently these sirens do not work, are not effective in very high winds also, and especially being 30, 50 feet and every 32, 32 of them, it'll be crazy. So I would suggest um, going investigating the alert FM system. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I have no more speakers. Let's, Kelsey, anybody online? There's one raised hand from Ryan. Okay, Ryan. Uh, thank you. Um, former Public Safety Commission Chair and Emergency Preparedness Task Force member. The alternative three is really the only one worth considering, and that would be something permanent. Everything else is just uh, let's try try it and prove it doesn't work, and it's kind of a waste of money. Um, there's some key facilities that the city already owns. That is the city hall building. You don't need a pole. You put a, a couple speakers on the corners of the, the building, hardly anybody would even notice. I don't even think you need a permit for that. So the other is the city owns two vacant parcels on the north side of Webway at Pacific Coast Highway, both corners. There's a vacant lot on the corner, it was conveyed separately from the, uh, the old bank building, which is a medical office and pharmacy currently. The, um, I think the city of uh, Calabasas and the other cities in the COG have received millions of dollars from the Metropolitan Transit Authority, which is our, our gas taxes coming back to us, to install fiber in throughout the city for municipal purposes. And that can run uh, traffic cameras, it can help with commuting, telecommuting, and run data and internet instead of paying the local franchise cable company and all that. And I was kind of shocked that the MTA would go for that, but they do it and, and the money's flowing. That's the kind of money you need. The city owns Bluffs Park and the city could partner with the Adamson House. They have an FCC transmitter there right now. Most people don't even know that. It's, just, it's not a 50 foot pole, it might be a 30 foot pole. Um, it could also transmit from the pier, although not so stable in emergency or bad weather. So the city has these places that, and obviously I would include uh, the Zuma uh, headquarters of the lifeguard because I think the utilities are underground and it'd be a good location. So by partnering with these other agencies, you rate higher in a grant to put in the fiber. And I would say only consider sirens because um, you could mail postcards to interpret, kind of like Morse code is what, what does that, uh, that signal mean? You could mail them out three or four times a year. Um, that expense would be justified. Um, there's a lot of changing technology. Um, better might be to have a local radio frequency transmitter trigger something, something that's transmitted locally, as with the alert FM, so that uh, you can hook up a whole system, kind of like a fire alarm system that would be triggered, like, like a pager, if you remember those, something going off. So. Consider the uh, the grant for the fiber interconnection as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Anybody else? No, those are all raised hands. Okay, but close public comment. Back to the council. Any more questions, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> still, still trying to come up with one, Steve. <laughs> Anybody have anything anything to offer? I'll start. Go ahead. Um, so I agree. I think the the 
Alternative four um, probably has the best, uh, greatest merit in my opinion. Um, the sirens, the, the locations, I'm going to say the famous words. I agree with John Maza on this. Whoever thought that would be heard, right? Um, I think that he's right. In the Santa Anas, the, the wind, you know, I mean, that's why we need to test it, is to assess that out, exactly what the um, uh, ability to actually hear any sirens or any announcements would be. Um, the, like I said, the alert FM, I think, is good for um, many people in our community that may have technology challenges. I think it would be better if we're looking um, as to some of the things, you know, cell phone, I got, you know, during the hurricane, got the announcement after the, the earthquake happened uh, on my phone, it came through. Um, but we, you know, Everything that you get comes through on your phone now. Everybody's notified about those stuff, and it's all pretty much geolocated. I think we should be looking at upping our technology that way. Um, I'd like to see better things done with uh, broadband throughout our community so that we have the facilities and the, um, the technology in our community so that that can be shared both between our residents and the millions of visitors that come to our community every month or year. Um, and so those are the things that I think would be better directed to staff look into um, supporting instead of the sirens. I think they're going to be a visual issue um, and I don't think that we're going to get the type of uh, response that um, is productive for what we're looking for. Thank you. Anybody on this side? Um, as some of you know, I was on the Public Safety Commission when we first brought this up, and everything that's been said is accurate about the flaws in the uh, siren system. It really is not for us. And by the way, those uh, siren locations were not picked at, by throwing a dart at the board. Those were scientifically based upon with the wind patterns and the echoes and the uh, canyons and so forth. It's a very well thought out study, and the placement of those is, is very exact. But Honestly, it's not, it's 1950s technology in a, in a 2020 world. And, you know, the old, those of you old enough to remember uh, civil defense, that's what this was for. It, we're past that now. And what I've talked about before in public safety and now here, we need a system that alerts and advises. And the test for me is what do we do at 3 o'clock in the morning when there's a fire or an earthquake? The Alert FM system is still relatively new. It's being used in Alabama uh, with all the uh, uh, public radio stations, FM stations supporting it for tornado alerts. And it has the ability to actually uh, comb down to a block or a small section of, of the city where you can have specialized messages that go out one way. So we can tell people to evacuate Big Rock, come down Big Rock, and when you get down to the end of the, uh, Big Rock and PCH, it could say, if you're a PCH in uh, Big Rock, turn right or turn left. And we could talk to people all the way through the city that way. This is the technology of the 2020s, and that's what we need to be using. Now, quick comment. Hans Letts has been a proponent for this. He's worked with the FM, uh, Alert FM people. There may be other vendors. But when you talk about putting this together, it's not for uh, KBU. Any FM station can carry this signal. If you can get any FM station at your house, it may be the one that activates your device. And they change as you go along. You don't have to have a radio turned on or anything. It's automatic. It's like a smoke alarm in your house. So I think this is a way to go. Let's, let's move into the 2020s. And by the way, there's another system that I do think we need to explore that is a siren uh, tower system. And it's been put in by the beaches and harbors at Torrance. It's been a two-year test. It's called Beals. It's, called, it's the Beach Emergency Evacuation Light System. And it has the ability to talk to everybody on the beach. And when we think about where our biggest problem is in the city, it's when we have visitors. And they may not have this alert FM device, or they may not have it in their car. But we can talk to them when they're at the beach. And the beaches are also our evacuation areas. Zumba Beach is one of the uh, key rally points. I can see Susan over there going, OK, you paid attention. Uh, and this is this is a way to talk to people at the beach. So it's a it's a 
kind of a hybrid combo system. And honestly, folks, I think Rob said it, 50-foot towers spread throughout the city. That's two-thirds of the size of the uh, uh, peppermint stick we've got here in the Civic Center. I don't think we're going to want to have those all around the town, much less in somebody's backyard. So let's do it the modern way as opposed to the siren way, and let's focus on that. And I know I've talked to the city manager about let's get, let's get FM radios all the way across the city for fire season this year. If you can do it, please do it. Okay, Steve? All right. So that's my comments, and I think I'm in favor of the FM or some indoor system. It doesn't have to be the alert FM. Let's just get it done. Bruce? Thanks, Steve. So I actually agree with everything everyone has said so far. Um, sounds like we're probably going to head to a unanimous decision. We'll see. Um, you know, the, I, the staff report says, and I remember this, that the, the decision by the city council to, to give direction to move forward with this, this was, that was made on November 9, 2020. There's not a single person sitting up here who was on council at that time. In fact, it was a lame duck council that made that decision, and it was under administration that believed in moving forward with OPM, other people's money. So it was like, we're going to get money to do sirens, so let's do sirens because we'll have money to do them. It's not a good reason. I think someone else said that already tonight. Um, Rob, I commend you on not only the, the presentation you did in the first place, but on providing us with your own recommendations because they were excellent and right on point. So I, I don't under, I suppose if we had a major problem in the middle of a day one day all of a sudden, there might be a lot of people outside who would benefit from the siren, but plainly in, at night, which is when most problems occur, um, if we're sleeping in our homes and a siren's not gonna reach inside our double um, paned windows, it's worthless. Uh, maybe there'll be a hiker out so sleeping somewhere out in the forest, but um, it's wor it's worthless to 90% plus of the city. I, I'm tempted to say we should go with the test just to see. Just, you know, don't rule something out based on belief, but find out empirically whether. What, what would be the cost of just doing the 8-1 um, the, the test? That's that's a 30000 So I don't, I don't know if there'd be an appetite for finding out whether we're being told correctly that people won't hear it indoors, but so that's a possibility. But the radios are clearly the, um, the front runner as far as I see it. Um, and I could make other comments, but I, I think we're probably all on, the, all on the same page here. Yeah, my question is, would it surprise you that I'm now in favor of alternative four? Okay, great. I, I agree with everybody else. Look, this is, Tech, the sirens are tech, World War II technology. This is 20, we're flying helicopters on Mars. I mean, it seems to me that I should have some way to come, a notification system that works inside the house. So I think we got enough. Anybody else, anything to say before we take a vote? I'll make a motion to approve uh, option four. I'll, I'll second that. Bob, do you have a question? So with that alternative four, do you want us to come back with an update on the funding to see if we can get fund the funding transferred, that part of it, or just provide council with an update, and kind of where we are. <laughs> Since I but, made the motion, let me let me say this: Let's get the solution, then we'll figure out how to pay for it. Sounds and good. honestly, at a hundred dollars a piece, we got eight thousand homes in the city. That's what eight hundred thousand dollars. That's cheaper than half this siren system. Bruce. Yeah, um, to follow up on what Doug just said, op it sounded to me like option four costs less than the delta between what the grant is and what we'd have to pay to go with the sirens. So if we can get money after we do it, all the better. But let's go ahead and do it would be my view. And, and I also like Doug's idea of even before we have this thing working, let's get radios into people's homes if we yeah. can as an initial part of it, even if we don't have the system fully up and running, because it's going to work for most people whether we have the system up and running or not. It's going to work for a lot of people anyway, and then they'll have the radios already once we get the system up and running. Doug, you have, are you ready? Anybody else? Uh, so the the motion you made a motion. Anybody second? I'll second it. If somebody has already seconded. You seconded it. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the motion was to go. direct staff to move uh, forward with option four. Let's do a roll call, Kelsey, please. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. All right, finally, unanimous thing. 
Thank you, Rob. Thank you. For, go home. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we got, how about a 10 minute break and we'll come back and see what we can get Mayor, finished. Mayor, before yes. we do that, yes. um, should we go ahead and release item 4B? Of the. And um, have the, it come. I mean, given the yeah. late hour, it seems appropriate that I we go ahead that. and Anybody? continue that. Actually, I have a request for a question for Trevor on that. Even though I was the one that advocated we drop it all together. Um, could we have a, um, a hearing on whether we have jurisdiction to have the hearing but not address the merits at all tonight? That way it's either over because we don't have jurisdiction or when we come back at the next meeting, we start right into the merits and don't have to discuss the procedural issue? No, they have a right to the public hearing, so you'd have to open the, the whole item if we're going to go forward with it. But we can't limit the public hearing to the question of do we have jurisdiction? No. Okay. I tried. <laughs> okay, so uh, Mary Ann's motion. I'll second Mary Ann's motion I'll, to okay. get rid to jettison for B to the next yeah. meeting. Uh, I, I think um, we should actually continue to a date uncertain, um, depending on what the decision is on the hybrid meetings, due to the noticing for this item has been noticed as a hybrid meeting, so it need to be re-noticed if there's a decision not to hold the future meeting in well, hybrid format. Maybe order. we should wait to vote on that question then until after we do 5A. So you can, uh, if, if, if you want to, I guess we Do it to a date uncertain unless, and if we do 5A and we, we can bring it back sooner, let's do that. Okay. So, right, I'm, I, so, so the, the motion is then to, con to uh, continue the item um, to a, a date uncertain, date uncertain unless, we, unless the city council elects to continue with hybrid meetings at the following meeting, then it can move to the next meeting? I, Done. I, I would just, te technically I would state it another way, which is that continue it to the next meeting unless it can't go on to the next meeting because of the noticing problem. Perfect. Well, we got lawyers here. All right, Mar uh, Kelsey, roll call, please. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, 10 minutes.
Council members, everybody, hey, grab a seat, folks. I would like to make a motion that we, I know we reorganized the agenda early, but I'd like to make a motion now to move item 4A next. Uh, that's the construction of the high school. Uh, they've been waiting for a long time. We've got to get them going. I mean, yeah. I'll second that. I'll third. Any, any argument on doing that? Can we get a roll call? Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Motion uh, carries. Okay, we, do we have a staff report on item 4A? Give us just one moment to get that PowerPoint up. Got you, okay. What's that? I'm trying, Steve. <laughs> exactly right. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. What I'd like to present to you this evening is the Malibu Middle and High School Campus Specific Plan Local Coastal Program Amendment, as well as the amendments to the general plan and the zoning ordinance. This item was heard by the City Council about a, a little over a year ago, I believe, and then it went to the Coastal Commission from there for changes to the Local Coastal Program Amendment. The Coastal Commission did approve an amendment, however, but with modifications. What we're doing this evening is to have the council consider those modifications. And in doing this, you'll be considering the modifications to both the local coastal program and the MMC at the same time. Uh, based on what happens tonight, if it's approved, we will come back at the next council meeting for the second reading. And then once the second reading is done, we will then transmit the signed ordinance to the coastal commission who will then report it, uh, the executive director will report it to the Coastal Commission at their um, anticipating November hearing. A and then this process is complete. So when can they break ground? <laughs> I would say that the conservative answer, and the Coastal Commission I know is trying, I, I believe they are trying to move up the date, but definitely after, uh, for sure, after they report it to their commission, in November, but they, I know they are working to see if Coastal will issue the notice of final action upon our final um, adoption of the ordinance. See if you can push that. I mean, I think that would be helpful to the school. So, okay. So I'm my sorry. first answer was a conservative one, yeah, I, but I know I, look, that they are we, working on it. Yeah, we hung them out long enough. Okay. So once again, this is just a little bit more specifics for you. This is all in the agenda packet. These are all the various uh, item numbers, so you've got the Local Coastal Program Amendment, General Plan Map Amendment, the Zone Text Amendment, and the Zoning Map Amendment. And the zone, only the LCPA item is the one that goes back to the Coastal Commission. The, other, the others are local. Uh, this is just a brief history for you of where we are with the project. And just to throw in here, the Planning Commission at their first meeting in September did approve the local coastal program uh, coastal development permit and that permit we uh, have it of course conditioned upon uh, adoption of these ordinances. Um, the NOFA was transmitted, the notice of final action for that was transmitted to the Coastal Commission. They have it in their hands. We delivered it in person uh, as well as a mailed copy. So the Planning Commission has approved all this already? Uh, they have approved the, the project itself, the CDP, yes, okay. Mayor. And once again, this is just kind of an outline of where we are here this evening. We have in your agenda packet, you have a new resolution to supersede the previous resolution on this matter. Uh, those are your land use plan changes. We have a new ordinance, Ordinance 512, to supersede 501. Once again, that's to make the modifications to the Local Coastal Program and the MMC to make it match the modifications done by the Coastal Commission. And then as part of tonight's action, we'll ask that you schedule the second reading and adoption of the ordinance for our next City Council meeting. And then once again, this just highlights, uh, goes into a little more detail about what I explained earlier, that once you're done here, we will be forwarding it to the Coastal Commission. 
This is a summary of the changes made by the California Coastal Commission. They had some minor updates to the LCP for consistency and clarification. They had some concerns that we did not uh, specify exactly the uses in the Esha buffer area. This would be the riparian habitat that exists on the west side of the school pro property. They added mitigating requirements for Esha buffer impacts, required development standards for the pool lighting due to the Esha that exists to the west, clarified the ESHA restoration plan requirements for, when, for why, when, and how the on-site riparian habitat will be implemented, and then also the creation of the Malibu, Malibu Middle and High School Campus Specific, over, uh, specific Plan Overlay District. This is a map showing the parcel that we're discussing this evening. This is the specific plan overlay map. This will be the new map uh, that it reflects the Coastal Commission modifications and it reflects, uh, um, um, uh, will replace the maps previously <laughs> adopted by the Planning Commission and City Council. And once again, there are multiple phases to this project. The CDP is for the phase highlighted there, which is phase one. Phase zero was the demolition, and then phase one will be the actual construction of the building. We do have two modifications this evening. In reviewing the agenda packet, we did find that there were some changes that the Coastal Commission asked that we make on uh, the exhibits, the, the LCP maps. and. What happened was when we submitted the map, which is the map that you see there on your left, there is that blue hatched area highlighted by the red box. There is also a legend uh, in the legend box there, the, the red rectangle towards the bottom on the left hand map there. And that was the key in the legend table to discuss what that cross hatching was. The Coastal Commission wanted that removed. And so the edit that we have this evening for you is to modify Exhibit A to look like the exhibit you see on the right-hand side, which essentially removes the cross-hatching, so now it's just the yellow overlay parcel, and also removes the, the in the legend there in the key area, what that cross-hatching was. Similar, our second modification this evening is to make everything match. This would be the zoning map that is in the Malibu Municipal Code. So to match the LCP, now on this one, we did remove the cross hashing. That's why you don't see it there on the left. But once again, it's in the legend. That's the rectangle on the bottom. We need to remove that from the map. And the resulting map will be the map you see on the right. Uh, so once again, this is just uh, the the cross hatching was how they were approved. The Coastal Commission requested as one of their modifications, we remove it. This evening, staff is recommending the following actions that the council adopt the resolution for the LCPA and general map plan amendments, uh, and then also introduce Ordinance 512 on first reading with the two requested edits that I just demonstrated uh, with the, the changes to the maps. And then lastly, direct staff to schedule the second reading and adoption of Ordinance 512. Before I conclude, one thing that I wanted to just quickly go over for the benefit of the council. Uh, I noticed this morning we were talking about this in the process of the preparation when the Word document that we did our work here for the red line and strike through attachment that you have in your packet. I believe that's attachments four and five, if I'm not mistaken. For whatever reason, when it got converted from the Word document to the PDF document, the chain, it, it was done in track changes and those changes were essentially all accepted. So you'll notice in your packet that you do not have a red line and strike through. It's, what you have is the final copy <laughs> in that attachment because of the way the conversion took place. Now, the ordinance and resolution that you have, that is correct. But once again, this was 
the reference material for the benefit of the council. So I'll just quickly thumb through these. Uh, this is the red line strike through. You can see like in the bottom box there, you can actually see the red with the underline for what is new. And this is the new language we added for the LUP policies. And once again, you do have this in your attachment. It's what you're missing is the strike through of what was taken out. You have the final. And what I've got basically is every one of the modifications here with also a quick summary. And we'll be glad to go into more detail on any of these if there are questions about what was cut out and why by the Coastal Commissions and added. But once again, these go back to reflect that a lot of this was the ESHA policies and also the mitigation. And as I mentioned, uh, the changes to the maps we had earlier and then also lighting uh, for the pool. And that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much. Any questions before we go to public comment? No? I've got two speakers, public speaker comments. Uh, Joe Drummond, you're up first. And I don't know if Ann Donine is still here, so I don't think so. So you get three minutes. I just want you guys to approve this. That's basically it. I'm sure you all are going to approve it. Um, it's, it's our kids' school. It's it needs to be done. It's, it, I think everything, all the heights are okay for this particular area because it's not blocking anyone's ocean view. But other than that, I think everything is good with this plan. So just put it forward. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Carl Randall, you're up next. And Stacy, you're going to come up after that. So if you want to get a seat up front just to move us along. Good evening, council members. Lloyd made me do this so I didn't block out. <laughs> so you can still see me. <laughs> uh, this is fortunately the thank you part of the process. So I want to specifically thank Renika and Richard. Um, we've been at this for a good six years. Um, it's been a heck of a process. Thank you all the council members for getting us through this, uh, getting us to the point that we get to break ground soon. And by August of 25, we will have a high school. So thank you all. Thank you, Carol. Stacy, you're next. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, to tag on to what to Carl has said, we've just really appreciated all the work and the process, um, not just between each other, but also all the other entities that were involved. And um, just this is a huge show of community, and we know it wasn't easy, so thank you. And we look forward to continuing to work together like this. Thank you very much. All right, I'll tell the speakers I have inside. Anybody online? There's one raised hand. Um, Karen Mickles. Karen? Hi there. It's um, Karen L. Harden. I don't know how to change my ah, name. Ah, Karen, on. yes. Uh -huh. Hey. Hi. Um, well, I, I want to tag along with everyone else and just say um, thank you for getting us to this point. And of course, I, I want to voice my support of approving the modifications so we can move forward with this and break ground. But thank you. Thank you That's very it. much. That's it. Yeah, I don't want to cut you off, Karen. Are you? No? All right. Anybody else? Any raised hands? No, we don't have any other raised All hands. All right, back up to the council table. Uh, public comments closed. I no? can't imagine there's any uh, negative comments on this. I'd like to make a motion to approve it as submitted. I'll, I'll second that. All right, just, I'll read the uh, ordinance title. It would be ordinance number 512, an ordinance of the city of Malibu amending local coastal program amendment number 21-002, zoning text amendment number 22-002, and zoning map amendment 22-001 as adopted by ordinance number 501 and pursuant to the conditional certification action taken by the California Coastal Commission on September 8th, 2020, 2023, in order to obtain final certification of the submitted local coastal program amendment application for the Malibu Middle and high school campus, 
a campus specific plan located at 30215 Morning View Drive, Santa Monica Malibu Unified District School District and finding the action to be exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and consistent with the EIR for the project with no further environmental review required under the California, Envir California Environmental Quality Act. <laughs> uh, Bruce, I'm sorry, yes. That's good. For a vote, I just want to say I, I, I voted against this complete plan the, the, the first time this was, came around two years ago because I thought there were some issues that were not adequately addressed. I don't recall whether it was a 4-1 vote or a 3-2 vote, but in any event, um, I'm glad to support this tonight because I think the changes that the um, Coastal Commission made are very helpful and satisfy a lot of the objections I had two years ago. Very good. Anybody else? I just want to say, you know, echo what Carl said. Um, we could not have done this without Renika and Richard um, dedicating so much time and effort and to uh, our city manager, Steve McClary. So thank you very much to staff, and I am so excited to see this going forward. And um, let's vote. Anybody else? I have a question. Oh, here we go. Go ahead. Uh, how? Richard, how much notice time do you need? Could we do the second reading on Thursday? <laughs> no, I don't think that provides us enough uh, time for that, right, Richard? Okay. That, that's correct. It, there's a, a, a certain amount of time we have to have pass between readings. Also, uh, Councilman Bricasanti, ordinances are required yeah. to be adopted at a regular meeting of the, the city adoption, council. The final action has okay. to be at a regular meeting. Anybody else? Okay, I want to thank Steve Massetti. He's been putting up with us for now. How long, Steve? A long time. All right. Kelsey, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart. I couldn't be more pleased to vote yes. Mayor Uring. Yes. Councilman Bricasanti. Yes. Councilman Riggins. Yes. Councilman Silverstein. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I'm going, to rec I'm going to recommend we do item 5A next, and then the last one will be the funding for the school, which should be pretty quick. Is that okay with everybody? So that's 5A and 3B4 together, right? Yes. Right. <clears throat> Can we get a staff report on 5A, please? I'm happy to. Just give me one moment to okay. get the PowerPoint up. Good evening, Mayor Uring and honorable members of the City Council. I'm here to present on items 3B4 and 5A tonight to get direction on how the Council would like to continue its meetings after AB 361 sunsets or the required bindings are no longer made. Currently, the Council and Planning Commission are both meeting in a hybrid format. Pursuant to AB 361, members of the public and members of the Council and Commission are able to participate in person or remotely. All other commissions and subcommittees are conducting entirely virtual meetings pursuant to AB 361. AB 361 does terminate on January 1st, 2024, and the Council should determine how meetings will be conducted at that time. As we experienced recently, hybrid meetings can be targets for Zoom bombing. This is when individuals participate remotely in public meetings, usually under false names, intending to disrupt the meeting by making incendiary comments or showing disturbing images. Instances of Zoom bombing at public meetings in California have increased significantly in recent weeks, and many jurisdictions are suspending hybrid meetings in response to these incidents. All individuals do have a right to speak at public meetings. If the city continues to allow remote participation, the council and the public may have to continue hearing these types of hateful comments. In-person meetings are less likely to be disrupted by these types of comments because individuals must show up in person to make these statements and they are not able to participate in the meeting under multiple names or accounts. If the council would like to suspend hybrid and virtual meetings, I would recommend doing so effective October 20th to avoid delaying time sensitive commission and subcommittee business that has been noticed for virtual meetings. If the council would like to continue hybrid meetings after AB 3, I'm sorry, after AB 361 terminates on January 1st, it should provide direction on how those meetings should be conducted. The Brown Act does not require remote participation, but the council could choose to allow the public to continue participating remotely. 
The council should consider if it would like to exempt any types of meetings from being conducted in a hybrid format, such as trainings or workshops, where the hybrid format limits the space where the training or workshop can be conducted and makes it the meeting a little more challenging to conduct. The council should also provide direction on how it would like to address meetings where technical issues, either on the part of the city or emergencies like power and internet outages, prevent remote participation. The council's last direction was to cancel a hybrid meeting when a power or internet outage affected 50% or more of the city. We are looking for update direction on that and for any outages, uh, I'm sorry, technical difficulties caused by the city that wouldn't allow us to uh, live stream the meeting via Zoom. If the council would like to conduct meetings despite any technical issues that may arise, staff will need to update the notice on the agenda to clarify that the meeting will not be canceled if technical difficulties occur. After AB 361, council members will still have the option to participate via teleconference, but they must do so pursuant to the Brown Act's general teleconference requirements or AB 2449's alternative teleconference provisions. As you might recall, the general teleconference requirements allow council members to teleconference from a notice location open to the public that would be printed on the agenda. AB 2449, alternatively, is only applicable if the council continues conducting hybrid meetings. It does allow council members to teleconference from a private location for just cause or emergency circumstances. This is a new regulation with some onerous requirements, including council approval to teleconference during emergency circumstances and limits on how often council members can use these teleconference provisions. If the council would like to continue conducting hybrid meetings and would like to use AB 2449 teleconference provisions, it should provide that direction now so staff can bring back a teleconference policy and a plan to meet the technical requirements of AB 2449. I'm sorry. Uh, commission meetings, except for the Planning Commission, are being conducted virtually. After AB 361 sunsets or the findings are no longer made, all commissions will return to in-person meetings. We will be sending out information to commissioners about how their meetings will be conducted, since many of them have never participated in an in-person meeting. We'll also include information about the attendance requirements for each commission. With that, I'm available for any questions you may have. Any questions? Uh, I've got uh, a couple here. On the hybrids, the Zoom bombing has is, is become a problem. I realize that. Do we have the capability in what you're proposing for like the Planning Commission to have experts by Zoom? They don't have to be here in person? Experts yes. representing the applicant or appellant? Or, or us, or the city. The staff could appear, but the applicant's representatives would not be able to once if you cancel it. And you think about tonight, this, you know, they're here, if they were on Zoom, they could still be at home or in their office. Um, that's unfortunate. Okay. Um, and the other question I have is on the um, council, on the commission meetings, why do we have to have them in rooms other than this room? This room is set up for uh, video. Would it not be possible to have, say, the Public Works Commission and so forth sit at the same dais? There are some, some cases where that won't be possible, such as for your Youth Commission, which has about 25 members. We wouldn't be able to seat that commission at the dais. We would, the biggest hurdle would um, be, be making sure we have the room available that often, since it's not usually something we have blocked out for the council chambers. We do often have other programming in here on the floor of the chambers. And if you would like your meetings, these meetings to be filmed or live streamed, we'd have to look at um, the level of media support we need to provide for that. Okay. Um, I know that a lot of the commissioners have told me they've gotten really used to this idea of being on Zoom. Um, they're going to have a, they're going to have a hard time coming home. Okay. All right. Thank you. Question, Paul. Not a question, just a thought. Got we did not receive any speaker slips for this item, but we do have a raised hand in Zoom. Okay. Craig Hill. Craig? Didn't you, Craig? Go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. Hi, Kelsey. Uh, just a few considerations for everybody. Frank Zoom calls are totally annoying. 
but the mayor can quickly determine whether there's any obscenity or hate speech and cut them off. The staff report indicated that other jurisdictions are cutting them off because they have video. We don't have that concern. The total time wasted in the past few meetings has been a minute or two, and now that you're on notice, it can be even less. And I think you're protected from, spree from free speech complaints if you have a reasonable basis to cut someone off. Meanwhile, some people, including those with immunocompromised conditions and the elderly, still have legitimate health concerns. Also in 2019, the council passed a declaration of climate emergency. I don't have the entire declaration in front of me, but just found news reports from the Malibu Times and Pepperdine News that quote from it. It says, we join 950 other cities around the world to set a direction for the future, dot, 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 including being carbon neutral and to work for an immediate transition and emergency mobilization effort to restore a safe climate. So in that context, I appreciate that when I have comments of three minutes or less, I don't have to pointlessly burn an entire gallon of gasoline getting to and from City Hall and spending half an hour in transit. Uh, that said, if the city offered me an electric car as part of my commissioner compensation package, I'd be happy to attend all meetings in person. On balance, I think you should be less concerned about remotely hypothetical free speech concerns and more about the actual needs of our residents, many of whom are elderly, the same demographic that cares most about civic issues and votes most consistently. And finally, I realize that you've had a lot on your plate tonight, but I should add that no one responded to my report about the Christmas crash. If not in dire jeopardy, it's at least being squeezed in a rather Grinch-like way. So hopefully you can have staff take a look at that and get back to the public. Thanks. Those are all the speakers. Okay. Bruce? Oh, can you put, uh, Paul, you anything? No? Okay, close public comment, back to the table, up to the dais. Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, so um, I actually believe there's a very simple solution here. In fact, I've previously proposed it, but I believe the city attorney said we couldn't do it. I disagree, and I'm going to repropose it again tonight and explain why and see if we can't get there. Uh, but first of all, there's articles all over the place about what's been going on throughout California as well as outside of California. I was going to, before this became an item on the agenda all of a sudden on Friday, I had a bunch of those articles ready to talk about, but I don't think there's a need to because we all know that what's going on. So the agenda for the meeting, um, hold on. The agenda offers us a Hobson's choice where we can either, one, restrict all public participation to those members of the public who physically attend a council meeting. Only people who come here can talk. Um, or we can allow all members of the public, everyone, to participate remotely. I submit that's a false dichotomy, and the law doesn't create that stark binary optionality. I'll begin with the non-controversial aspect of our choice. The Brown Act plainly and unambiguously does state that, quote, all meetings of the legislative body of a local agency shall be open and public, and all persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of the legislative body of a local agency, close quote. So we are statutorily mandated to permit any member of the public to appear in person at an in-person city council meeting and speak their piece subject, of course, to reasonable decorum requirements. And that's, that's a good requirement. If we have a lot, if we have an in-person meeting, not a hybrid meeting, anyone who comes to City Hall is welcome to come in here and they sign up a speaker slip and they get to say what they want to say. Also non-controversial is that meetings conducted pursuant to the teleconference option of AB 361 or AB 2449 must permit similarly unrestricted public participation by remote means. So if we have teleconference meetings or what we're calling hybrid meetings, we have to permit everyone to call in and say whatever they want to say, subject, of course, to decorum issues. Importantly, however, and this is what's been overlooked, AB 2449 does not require us to allow all members of the public to participate remotely if we permit any member of the, pu any member of the public to participate remotely. Let me say that again. Let me say it a little differently. Consistent with AB 2449, we can lawfully permit some members of the public to participate remotely and restrict other members from doing so. How can we do that? Council agenda report states on page three, quote, AB 2449 is only applicable if the council continues to offer members of the public the opportunity to participate remotely. 
That's an inaccurate statement that results from a, logical fallacy, a logically fallacious reading of the code. AB 2449 is one of two sources of authority for the city council to meet remotely. The other is AB 361. Contrary to the statement or the suggestion, at least in the council agenda report, AB 2449 is not triggered by a decision to permit members of the public to participate remotely. AB 2449 does not authorize the public to participate remotely. What AB 2449 does is it mandates that the public be permitted to participate remotely if the city council authorizes itself to meet remotely. So, AB 2449 is one of two sources of authority. Oh, I said that already. Specifically, the public participation provisions of AB 361 and AB 2449 are applicable when the city council conducts its meeting, quote, by teleconference, close quote. That's what the statute says. The staff agenda report inaccurately considers a teleconference meeting to be one where the public is provided the opportunity to participate remotely. In fact, however, both AB 361 and AB 2449 expressly and specifically define the term teleconference to mean the following, a meeting of a legislative body the members of which are in different locations connected by electronic means through either audio or video or both. That's what we were doing during the pandemic. That is what is meant by a city council meeting conducted by teleconference. It has to do with the location of the city council members, not the location of the public. If the city council members meet remotely, all members of the public have to be permitted to participate remotely. There is absolutely nothing in the law that states that if the city council meets in person and can only meet in person, that the city council can't permit some people to participate remotely and restrict other people from participating remotely. Because of this, we've been offered up not the most sensible alternative. Namely, we cease making the AB 361 finding. We not authorize council meetings or for that matter, commission meetings to be held by teleconference pursuant to AB 2449, we don't make a finding that we can do that. We resolve that permanent residents of Malibu be permitted to attend in person or by telephone, internet, or other electronic means subject to a specified sign up, timing, and other reasonable provisions. So the solution works like this. Terminate teleconference meetings of the city council and commissions. All meetings will thereafter be in person by the legislative body. In accordance with the Brown Act, all persons shall be permitted to attend all such meetings. Anyone in the world can come here. They want to fly here from Dallas and make their spurious statements. They are welcome to do so. If we've not done so already, we have to adopt and implement a procedure for receiving and swiftly resolving requests for reasonable accommodation for individuals with disabilities consistent with the ADA. We haven't really talked about that, but that's in, in AB 2449 without regard to how we meet. And lastly, we can adopt a resolution providing permanent residents of Malibu the privilege of being permitted to attend meetings by telephone, internet, or other electronic means subject to a specified sign-up timing and other reasonable provisions. Rationale for this. Again, I, and I, I'm, I'm going to say this only because it's a legal issue and we need to have a lawful, rational reason for doing this, so I want to make a record of it. Again, the Brown Act requires that all meetings of the legislative body by a local agency shall be open and public, and all persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of the legislative body of a local agency. Pursuant to that requirement, we can't restrict public participation by any member of the public that elects to attend a public meeting. While the Brown Act does require reasonable accommodation for individuals with disabilities consistent with the ADA, the Brown Act does not mandate that the City Council permit members of the public attend meetings remotely. It doesn't require that. As a general matter, the law permits legislative bodies to provide for differing treatment of identified segments of the population, so long as doing so does not, one, restrict or impair a constitutional or statutory right under state or federal law, or two, discriminate among members of the public on the basis of race, religion, gender, or some other suspect class. Where there is no applicable constitutional or statutory right, which there's not here, and no suspect class involved, which there's not here, Differing treatment of, in, of identified segments of the population is permissible so long as it has a rational basis. This is Constitutional Law 101. 
A perfect example of this concept is our fee waiver program, which applies only to Woolsey Fire rebuilds, and it's available only to owners at the time of the fire. Plainly, the fee waiver program discriminates among members of the public. It does not, however, do so on the basis of a suspect classification. There's a rational basis for the distinction. Qualification for election to the city council and for appointment to city commissions is another example. They're restricted to permanent residents of the city of Malibu. Like the fee waiver program, the permanent residency requirement discriminates among members of the public, does not do so on the basis of a suspect classification, and has a rational basis. I submit that there's a similar rational basis for providing permanent residents of Malibu the privilege of being permitted to attend meetings by telephone, internet, or other electronic means subject to a specified sign-up, timing, and other reasonable provisions. Permanent residents of Malibu are the only people who are able to vote for the election of city council members, to approve local bond measures, to approve local reverend referenda. Permanent residents of Malibu are most directly impacted by decisions of the city council. Local residents are the folks with whom we interact on a day-to-day -day basis and whose interests we seek to advance when we meet as a city council. In essence, the privilege I'm proposing is the analog to the residency requirement for service on the city council and city commissions. To repeat, the city council lacks the authority to curtail legal rights based on state or federal law. If we do not adopt a resolution pursuant to AB 361, our meetings will be in person and the only state or federal law right at issue will be the right to attend and speak in person. Separate and apart from having in-person meetings at which the legal rights of all members of the public are honored, we have the authority to permit members of the public to attend meetings by telephone, internet, or other electronic means, subject to specified sign-up timing and other reasonable provisions. Moreover, we have the right to limit that privilege to permanent residents of Malibu, so long as there is a rational basis for doing so. I submit there is a rational basis for doing so, and that's what I'm proposing that we do. So I move that we terminate the findings and that we affirmatively resolve that permanent residents of Malibu be permitted to subject, we'll have to, the management will have to figure out a way to confirm who they are, but that permanent residents be permitted to sign up in advance and call in, but that is not available to people in Dallas, it's not a people to, available to people in Santa Monica. If they wanna come here, they can drive here and they get to say their piece. Can I get I'll a second? I'll second this for the purposes of discussion. Thank you. And may I ask a question that's actually a question? Please do. Okay, my, uh, how are we defining a permanent resident of Malibu? A person who's eligible to, to sign up to vote in Malibu. So we're They don't have to be registered, but they have to be eligible to be registered. So if they're younger than the registration age to vote, they can't call in. Or a child of such a person. And are we going, how are we going to, how are we going to develop the list of eligible it, it's, people? It's actually pretty easy. You have a driver's license that states the place of your permanent residence. If you don't have a Malibu driver's license, you have a Santa Monica driver's license or some other place, you're not a Malibu resident, permanent resident. So if, if we have someone who has two homes and their driver's license is going to the other home, but they have a home here, they can't do this. They're not a permanent resident. They have a second home here. It's not their permanent residence. There are a lot of people that call Malibu home, reside here. This is their primary residence, but for a variety of reasons, they maintain another residence in another area. Um, I'm really not comfortable discriminating against people based upon their ability to reside here full time. Um, also, the, you know, there's a variety of reasons. You, you get registered to vote in Malibu, but your work takes you to another area. So I, I don't think that it's going to be easy to establish who's a permanent one, who's not a permanent one, and we're gonna end up discriminating against people um, by doing that. So. I would, if the, if the council is interested in this, I would suggest that um, you, you continue the item and I can provide you with some analysis. I'd rather not lay out the legal issues I see with doing this um, in this form in case you're interested in going forward with it. It would also need to have a number of procedures that be sorted, need to be sorted out and brought back to the council in any case. If I could ask a question, is there, do you think this is going to lead to the, well, let me put it this way. I think we are doing a disservice to the function of the Council and Planning Commission 
if we don't allow people to be inputting into the meeting remotely. And I'm talking about the uh, experts from the applicants on the Planning Commission, and I think for people that have issues that they want to bring forward here, uh, I think that's a, a, a mistake on our part if we can't do it. Are you saying that there's, if you study it up, you're going to be able to give us a better answer, or what? I have a, I have a lot of concerns with potentially doing this. Also, those experts would most likely not be residents. Um, right. If you're in a, in a situation where you have a public hearing and due process rights involved, each side would need to have the same ability to participate in that. Um, there's also, you know, a, a right in California to participate anonymously in city council meetings. You do not have to give your name, so a verification system could create issues for doing that. Um, this is also a limited public forum, and there's First Amendment issues attached to. Okay, and along that line, what about staff? If uh, if, if staff is attending remotely, staff can participate re remotely. That that's um, that, that's not governed by how the public comment is 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 taken. Okay. Um, we can have consultants call in and participate um, that way if it's part of the city staff. Okay. So um, the issue of whether you can require identification, you can't as a general matter. So you can't infringe on the right to show up at a meeting and speak and fill out a card and not, not even give your name, just say, I'm, I'm person X. But if we're granting a privilege that's in addition to the right that everyone has to come here, my understanding is we can place restrictions, reasonable restrictions, rational restrictions on a privilege that we're not required to extend. As far as um, Marianne's concern and Doug's concern, First of all, I disagree that we ought to extend that privilege to non-residents, no matter how much affinity they have to the city of Malibu. But we could do that too. I mean, we, we have the ability using rational basis to identify whatever classification, however complex we want to make it or simple we want to make it, of who can call in and who can't call in. We can't use a um, constitutionally impermissible classification. But beyond that, we can use our, our heads and we can make any rational distinction. So we could say you've got to live within 20 miles. We can say you have to, there's all kinds of things we can do. We can, we can spin all that out. I believe, to respond to Doug, I believe we can even permit parties to hearings because that's a classification that's rational as well. There's no rule that says a party to a hearing has to be at the meeting. Again, the legislative body has to be at the meeting if we're not authorizing hybrid meetings. No one else has to be here, only we do. We can permit any rational classification subset to come here remotely if we choose to. So, um, you know, I, I think it's worthy of debate as to what that classification should be and I, I, I favor bringing this back to the next meeting to have that discussion more fully, but I think this concept works. And I think it's a model for other cities in, Ma in um, California, frankly. Any other call? Is anyone else doing this now? No, they haven't figured it out. Okay. Where are you? So who's going to be the arbiter of these um, requirements? Is that something that staff's going to be the one? And what happens when a staff member inadvertently makes a mistake or somebody doesn't get heard because they were misclassified? The answer is the city council decides what the qualifications are, and then the staff ministerially applies them. I just think that's putting way too much of a burden on staff for them to um, have to go through this process of doing this. You know, if we it, let somebody else figure this out. If somebody else comes up with a system, then we can look at that and we can make a, arrangements to make modifications. But the way it's proposed, it's gonna, it's really going to burden our staff. And as we know, we're already short staffed and this is just gonna make it more of an impact on them. So there, and mistakes happen. There, there, there's a sign-up requirement is what I said, and the sign-up could be a week in advance of the meeting. There's more than ample time to go to Trevor to get ironed out any ones that are questionable. And we don't release our staff reports ten, 10 days before a meeting. 
So somebody's going to get the staff report. They're going to have to go through the process. They don't make the time frame to do that, and they miss being able to speak remotely because they didn't qualify in time. It, it just sounds like it's going to be okay. a recipe for disaster. So, so, so here's the point. If, if the majority are in favor of continuing to have hybrid meetings where we have to let everyone in the universe call in and say whatever they want to say, then we don't need to do this at all because that I'm against that, but that would be the other alternative. All I'm saying is that if we're going to bite the bullet and say we have to have live meetings, this gives an additional protection to certain people. It's not a perfect system, but the perfect is the enemy of the good. It identifies a, an important group of people, maybe subject to some constraints, that will still be permitted to call in rather than have to trudge over here if they wish to, or if they have immune problems, if they wish to, they will be able to call in. I'm not saying that, I mean, it, it would be in a perfect world, we'd have hybrid meetings and we would have some kind of reasonable restriction on who can call in, but we're not allowed to do that. Here's my suggestion. Go ahead, I'm, Paul, I'll you hear first. your suggestion. My, uh, Trevor said, let him go back and take a look at it, see what kind of a program he can come up with, and see if there's a, a rational way to do this, all right? Uh, if it comes back, and, and as long as it were, what he's going to do is take a look at ways to try and make this thing work under the, sort of the, the circumstances we've been talking about here, I think it's worth having him do that and then bring it back and let's talk about it. At least we've got a little more meat on the bone before we say no. I'd like to make a motion to do exactly that. Let's have Trevor uh, study it and bring us back a, a recommendation. We know we're going to have to have uh, the commission meetings in person. The only question is the planning commission and the council meeting, hybrid or not hybrid. And so I, it, yeah, and my, I mean, look, I don't think we can put the, the, you know, the toothpaste back in the tube. We've had hybrid meetings. People are, you know, look around. I mean, we got, you know, we're not exactly packing the room with, uh, so, yeah, well, first of all, there, there's a motion on the table. I'll, I'll withdraw it in favor. In, in, I'll, I'll defer to what Doug just said, but to be clear, we, we had this discussion before. Um, we wanted to be able to say only the city council needs to come live and that we can still have hybrid meetings at commissions. Maybe we wanted to say that the planning commission has to be live, but others can still meet. My understanding is that it's all or nothing. We either make a finding under California law that allows teleconference meetings, they're really not called hybrid meetings, or we don't. If we make a finding to allow teleconference meetings, all bets are off, the universe is invited. If we don't make that finding, everyone must, every, every um, legislator, including all commissioners, must attend in person, subject to being ill or whatever, or out of the country and calling in on occasion. Um, and then we have this ability to discriminate, not in an unlawful way between who can call in and who can't. But we can't have both systems at the same time. We have to have one or the other. Unless, unless Trevor has different advice this time around. If you make the AB 361 findings, I think that's what you're talking about, then everyone, the public, everybody has the right to participate remotely. Once you stop making that, then the council can elect to allow hybrid participation. Um, you know, that's something that we can, we can allow, but it's not, then it's, there's no right for the public to, there's no right to the public to have those public meetings if we stop making AB 361 findings. What's being talked about here is, you know, providing that right in a limited fashion, not allowing most jurisdictions, all jurisdictions currently in California, if they, most have stopped making 361 findings, but they have decided to have a hybrid, you know, option as well. And once they do that, they allow it, everyone to participate, the, the same as they have been under AB 361. Um, the only difference is that there's more um, restrictions on how the council members or commissioners may participate in those meetings once you see making the AB 361 findings. So I hope that was clear. Let's go back to his motion. Yes. Do I get a, is there a second for that? I'll, I'll second. Please. And the motion is for um, staff and my office to research okay. options for um, bringing back a hybrid um, a hybrid format option that would allow some restriction of who may participate remotely based around residency and to provide my and analysis to, start, to the yeah. council. Yeah, and if you got to tweak it a little bit as you go through it, I mean, you know, but, but the concept is 
we're going to use residency as at least a, a foundation to start identifying who can come in. There may be other, you know, it mm -hmm. may be if they're a consultant to a, somebody doing a project, if that person identifies a consultant, they can get them in by Zoom. I mean, there may be ways to get there. Just, let's just okay. let's be positive I'll, and try. I'll, I'll work with Kelsey to bring an item back to the council and also provide a, um, I will also advise the council about potential issues with, with uh, yeah. going down that route. Let's be, well. let's be clear. We know we're going to have to have the commission to accept the planning commission. We're going to have to meet in person because when 361 or whatever it is, uh, yeah, 361 expires, that's the end of that. So the only question I'm proposing is give us information, recommendations for planning commission. So it's only for PC and city council right. meetings you want to do this. Okay. You want to know the options. Okay. Thank you. Kelsey, roll call. Anybody else? I'm sorry. I don't want to cut anybody can, off. Can we have the motion restated, please? Sure. I think we're going to need, we're going to need two motions too because one's going to get to the 361 findings next. Um, but the direction is to direct staff, um, including myself and the, the city attorney's office and the city clerk's office, to return to the council with a recomm with uh, recommendations or options um, related to terminating AB 361 findings, but providing a hybrid option that would limit participation primarily based on residency. And I will also provide advice to the council regarding any legal issues with, um, with, with such options. Well, well could, could we accept a friendly amendment on that. Um, I think that it ought to be with options for rational classifications, not necessarily limited to residency, whichever ones make whatever rational classifications you believe in, in, in recommending to us make sense taking into account all the comments that were made tonight, because I, I understand Mary Ann's comment and I want to accommodate that. Well, I can't make the motion, so you can just make that as the motion. So the, well, the, the, so the, the, the amendment to the motion that you stated already is um, with recommendations as to various reasonable accommodations that could be made that would limit remote participation, but still permit it in certain circumstances. Got it. You, take, you accept that amendment? Yeah. Marianne? No, I withdraw my second. Steve, I'll you go for yeah. it. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept that, yes. Well, as a technical matter, I'm not sure that you can have an amendment that's not accepted. Well, no, Steve did. I, I withdrew my okay. second. Steve substituted his second. He accepted the amendment. Okay. Correct? So, so we, have okay. A, we have a withdrawn and then we have a substitute motion. Right. The original motion was withdrawn, so the substitute motion is the only motion on the floor. Okay. Kelsey, roll call. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? No. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you very the, much. We have. Hold on, the, the second item, we need to decide if you want to continue making the AB 361 findings and if you do, how long you want to you make it for the full 30 days or if you want to make it for a shorter period of time. Can you remind us what the findings are? That, 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 um, I believe it is a, to pull it up, but it's a, that uh, federal, state, or local, sorry, state or local authorities are still recommending that social, dis, uh, social distancing that's required. We have to make that finding every 30 days in order to maintain the AB 361 yeah. provisions. So the motion would be either staff's recommendation for item 3B, is it 4? 3B4. 3B4, yeah. Or some modification to it. If you want to make it for a shorter period of time, we could. Less than 30 days? But if you want to continue how things are until we bring this back, I would suggest just making the staff recommendation. I, I have a question. Uh, is it correct that we can't make the finding if it's not true, but we're not required to make the finding if it is true? Correct. You, you have the choice of terminating the AB, um, terminating making those findings, or you can continue to make them. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion that we uh, continue 361 for another 30 days and which gives us enough time to have our second meeting and learn about this. And in any event, if we don't make a finding, then 361 goes away sooner than January. So that's why I think we ought to do it now. Is there a second? I'll second. So that was staff's recommendation for 3B4, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Kelsey, roll call. 
Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. We have one item left, 6B. Do we have to vote? We do. Okay. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we continue the meeting to accommodate item 6B. I need. I'll second. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. D does anyone have an understanding of how long this item is likely to take? I, my suggestion is it's going to go back to the Administrative and Finance Committee where you're going to do the detail work there. So I think what we're really just doing tonight is saying there's a need to, for this process. Uh, let's send it back to Administrative and Finance, see what the heck you guys come up with. You've got two smart people on that committee, so okay. I'm sure we can count on you. So we're not, we're not looking to take action just other than to send, send it to that, the committee? That's my take, yes. Okay. That's, that's, that's correct, Mr. Mayor and Councilmember Silverstein. We're, we're simply asking for Council to give that direction to send this matter off to the Admin and Finance Committee where okay. they will take a look at it, come hear up. from public, and provide a recommendation back to the City Council. So I have a question. Do, do we have to take public comment? I'm well, sorry. We're, we still need to vote on whether to hear the matter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll, let's do a roll call vote to hear it. Mayor Uring? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Mary Ann? Um, uh, is there public comment or staff yeah, report? If you get a question, you can ask a question. We'll do public I don't. I don't have any public we comments. Have, you get them now. <laughs> Oh, I do have public speakers. Okay, go ahead, Marianne. Well, I know I had expressed um, whether or not any of the library funds um, can be directed to this, and we have a meeting next week with the library um, subcommittee. I don't think, which one? So, what's the question? <laughs> How does that play into um, this decision to send it to a and um, well, Is that something I, we can still discuss at the library I think to see if there's I, any funds available? I, yeah, there? I think maybe two committee. I mean, A&F takes a look at whether they want to do it, and the library committee has to decide whether those funds are available. Okay. I, right? I mean, I think that's how stuff works. It, yes, Mr. Mayor, that, that's true. It, it, is coming, it is coming to the library committee, and, and they have an opportunity to, to weigh in, right. uh, and then and alternatively, or in addition, you could also send it off to A&F and get their, get their recommendation and come right. back. Okay. Okay. So any, uh, uh, public comment, Stacy. I'm, I'm sorry. Is there a staff report? Is there? There, there is. Is there a staff report? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think we pretty much covered. I'm happy yeah, to we, again. We, I we, think we did the staff. Report. Council has this request. It's from the uh, Malibu PTSA and also from the Malibu Schools Leadership Council. Um, and council had previously directed to put it on the agenda tonight so that we could consider directing it to the admin and finance committee. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, cool. Let me just, I, I have spoken in the course of doing this with uh, Karen, I can't remember her last name, oh, um, and, and she has provided additional documentation. I think she sent this to the city. Uh, just make sure that it goes to the a &F committee because there's some stuff in there that makes it easier to, to understand what the heck we're doing. So that was, but she was very good in accommodating the process. All right, so, where that, okay, so now we're off the table. We can go to public comment, I believe. Uh, Stacy, you want to go first, and then I got John Moss. Is he going to do this remotely? He's not in Zoom. He's not in Zoom. Okay. Um, hello again. Uh, so just, um, I appreciate you bringing this forward, and if you have any um, questions or need context, um, I and other people on that are healpy, happy to help. I'm too, it's too late for me to talk clearly. <laughs> happy to help. Um, and uh, just to reiterate, these are um, initiatives that Malibu Schools Leadership Council has talked about um, for years and has support for. Um, and um, it, it just really is uh, establishing centralized fundraising within Malibu to pull it off of the weight off of our PTAs and PTSAs has needed to happen for several years. And um, we're so thankful uh, to come to this time. And uh, so just thank you for hearing that. And we're happy to see what happens next with both the library and with the smaller committee. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Stacy. All right. Public comments closed. Back to the table. Any comments from up here? Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. There's one speaker on Zoom, Karen Mickles. Cal Hardy. Oh, Hardy. Oh, okay, Karen. <laughs> Hi there. You Since get, I'm here, to, I get might. To, you get to speak twice. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Um, I just, I, I wanted to um, obviously give my support to, to moving this over. And I again want to thank the city council for um, your time and constructive feedback over the summer and bringing this for this proposal forward. Um, I really appreciate uh, and, and respect the, um, the work that you, you did to help us and, and everything that you do for the community. Um, I also wanted to just um, publicly thanks uh, the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education for their time as well over the summer and for pledging their support for the same proposal and providing 200,000 in funding to split between the two elementary schools. Um, as part of this ask. So once again, thank you for all you do. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, anybody else? Those are all the raised hands. Okay, any comment up here? I move that we send this to a and F. I'll I'll second that. Kelsey? Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Riggins? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stewart? Yes. Mayor Uring? Yes. Motion carries. In honor of. In support of. In support of what's going on in the Middle East on both sides of that. Mayor, your microphone. Oh. Uh, we're going to adjourn in support of what's going on in the Middle East for both of those parties. It's terrible to have that whole thing take place, uh, and I hope they're able to solve something. Yeah, to be clear, it's in support of the. Um, the innocent people that are being yes. injured and slaughtered unnecessarily. Okay. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you.